How's it going everyone? This is Miles with Windows Central Gaming and welcome to the 43rd episode of Xbox Chatterdays. Today, I am stoked to be do be joined by my dude, David Whitaker of Level 1 Gaming. How you doing on this fine Saturday, my man? Dude, I am I was doing okay until I got in here with you. Now I'm doing fantastic, ooh, right? So I'm, I was super excited. When you sent the message to come on, like, I don't think I had 6.7 seconds to respond. That's how quickly I came back. <laughs> like, yeah, of course. Let's do it, man. I, I've, I've always loved having you come on to WSP Podcast and have the opportunity to come and be on your platform with you. It was a no-brainer, dude. No-brainer. Stoked to have you on. Yes, I've partook in the double XP experience. You know, we, we joked about even, you know, starting a spinoff called uh, Triple XP. Uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that on a later date, but it's been yeah. too long. I'm excited to have you on and we have a lot of great stuff to talk about today. We're gonna be talking Indeed. about Big Tencent scooping up a chunk of Bloober team. We're gonna be talking about the past, present and future of gaming, 20 years of Xbox and our impressions of Battlefield 2042's beta back for blood and Nickelodeon all-star brawl. But before we get into all of that, David, for the amazing people joining us today, let everyone know who you are, where they can find you and why you love gaming. Yeah, well, uh, I am David, uh, also known as fame ENT 2K. Some people like to say it's fame int, but it is ENT. Or if you're a Dallas man, you want to make fun of me, you say entertainment. Uh, yeah, I, uh, some people may, May or not remember me, I used to write for TickGamesNetwork.com. I used to podcast over there uh, for those who remember the Tick days. And uh, I got a lot of uh, knowledge and information over there. And then I decided to go out and form uh, Level 1 Gaming with such an amazing thing that I have. And uh, yeah, if you guys ever are interested in having some laughs, having some fun, check out LV1Gamer.com. Uh, Every Wednesday, our flagship show, which is 2XP Podcast. You guys come check it out. We would love to have Miles come back on again because uh, I'm, I'm sure he, he's having a great time with us hanging out. And, uh, yeah, man, we do shows seven days a week, and we just want to entertain people, man. This And being able to come onto this show is, is a godsend. It lets me know that, hey, maybe there's a couple of people on this planet that actually like like me and like the content <laughs> oh, come that on. I do. Um, so that that was honestly, I'm telling you, I said this before the show, and I'm gonna say it loud. Like I was extremely ecstatic when I got the message from you because this is one of my Saturday podcasts, right? Uh, I'm a creeper, so I'll go on <laughs> podcast and I'll just sit and watch. And this is a staple on everyone's side. It's like the Iron Lords a staple for Sunday. This is my Saturday staple show, so I'm super happy to be here. Uh, you can guys can catch anything I do at lv1gaming.com. I am on Twitter at fameint2k. Um, if you see the Phoenix, that's us. If you don't see the Phoenix, that's not us. And uh, yeah, man, I'm not too big on talking about myself. I like talking about my team, um, the floor hugger, Baron, who's in the chat, Dallas man, uh, Citizen Snips. If you guys know the man with the clamps, I love talking about my team. So yeah, yeah, I'm excited to uh, I'm excited to be here, man. Thank you again. Absolutely. There's, as you can see in the chat, ton of fame, love. So again, excited, stoked to have you on. You're an awesome dude. You've been out here doing amazing work with Level 1 Gaming, and I'm honored and happy to share it with, with the Xbox Chatterdays crew. Um, we're going to dive straight into our first topic, which involves a studio that's near and dear to my heart, a studio that I love as a big horror nerd, and that's Bloober Team, and some kind of strange news that broke late this week involving Tencent, the industry giant, the, the endless bag of money that is Tencent, <laughs> has scooped up 22% of Blooper Team shares, making them the majority shareholder now of Blooper Team. So first off, when you saw this news, was this ever something you even considered to be a possibility? When it comes to Tencent, yes. Uh, I think a lot of people, for reasons that aren't, you know, necessary or people not using their brain cells correctly, uh, people look at Microsoft as the big bad as far as acquiring studios. But Tencent, and I've said it a hundred times, they are the ones you really need to be looking out for because they don't hesitate. And you will look up one day and they will have majority ownership of a company you never even thought. Um, any publisher, any developer that's independent, I'm not shocked to hear that Tencent either fully owns the company or owns majority stakeholders. Now, lately, we've seen them do the 
the 22%, 25%, 30%, more mm -hmm. so the your R's now, right? And so I think that's a, that's a, just a, oh my God, strategic move <laughs> uh, by Vincent. And uh, I'm really looking to see how this is going to play out for them in the future. But what's better than owning the entirety of a company is owning the majority stakeholder. And, and Bloober team, um, they've gotten a lot of love and a lot of rumors surrounding them recently, you know, as far as are they doing Silent Hill with Konami and things of that sort of that nature. And uh, the medium, for all intents and purposes, wasn't a bad game. It was a pretty good game uh, from them to kick off this generation. Um, so I, I am not surprised that Tencent is doing this. Uh, I'm more surprised that Blue Team, who's picking up momentum, is willing to give up so much of their of their company. Yeah, I've been shouting the the praises of Bloober Team for a long time. They've been a standout independent developer, and they they self publish a lot of their titles as well. So for a team that is doing all of their own work, they've put out pretty incredible projects, considering the budget that they've been given to deliver these, and considering the size of their team. So you know, with with all the acquisition season rumors and talks, I've been championing championing the idea of. Xbox, bringing in Bloober Team to mm -hmm. Xbox Game Studios to fill that horror gap, to have this dedicated in-house horror studio. And I just, ultimately, I'm excited because Bloober Team will have more resources. And yes. I, I want to see that big budget Bloober Team game more than anything, because I've seen the potential of their smaller budgets, yeah, smaller budget releases. And I want to see them get that big bag of money to just go all in and fully realize these, these visions that they have. because. They've shown they have good ideas. They've shown they're creative. Mm -hmm. They've titles. You really love what they're doing. And to know now that they have that financial backing to continue to be creative, to continue to put out the games that you love on a bigger scale. At the end of the day, yes, it, it, it is. It does suck that they're not, you know, the dream didn't come to fruition of them joining Microsoft. But to know, OK, this studio will continue to be able to publish out and push out games um, hopefully, uh, with uh, their own creative freedom. That's that's amazing. At the end of the day, as gamers, that that's the ultimate joy that comes from this. Yeah, it's it also shows me that Bloober Team must have some big projects that have Tencent excited. If Tencent, who is most interested in making money, that is the reason you buy a majority share of a company is you mm -hmm. see potential, you know that something that they're working on has the potential to make a lot of money. That is why Tencent did this. That's why Tencent didn't buy them outright. They said, we're trying to diverse our, di diversify our portfolio. We see Bloober Team as financially viable, and we're going we're gonna to get a little piece of that. We're going to make sure that when they blow up or if they blow up, that we're getting a big chunk of that, of that. So like you touched on, there have been the rumors of Bloober Team working on Silent Hill for a while. They just announced Layers of Fear with Unreal Engine 5, which I'm, I'm incredibly excited to see what that looks like. So... Do you think there's anything else that we don't know about? Or do you think, you know, maybe Silent Hill was enough for Tencent to throw some money down? Seeing Bloober Team officially partner with Konami, maybe that got Tencent thinking, okay, if Konami sees value in this, maybe we need to jump on board. And that's it. You know, if, if, if for all intents and purposes that this was Silent Hill is absolutely true, that's enough to, to get someone like Tencent involved. Uh, maybe not so as much as, hey, we're buying out the whole studio, but to say, hey, we want, you know, 22%, you know, stakehold in this studio. And to me, that's such a big polarizing franchise. Um, mm -hmm. Coming off the heels of of what we saw with a little bit with PT and people have been excited for something Silent Hills related since then. That name is big enough to draw attention and people are going to buy it just off the the notion that hey here's a new silent hill game being done by a studio whose expertise is horror titles yes uh, again there, it's it's controversial the idea of bloober mm -hmm. team making a silent hill i'll be honest upsets people i uh, you know because i've been talking about the the coincidences and the rumors and basically you know letting people know for a long time now that there's a strong po a real strong possibility mm -hmm. that bloober team is working on silent hill um, and just me even mentioning that it made people upset because it's, it's not the Kojima dream. It's not the Kojima Silent Hills dream, which we all want. I, I would love Kojima to come in and, and do Silent Hills again. I just don't I think don't that's currently happening. happening with everything that happened between Kojima and Konami, at least not anytime soon. 
But the fact that Konami is willing to partner with a studio who has, you know, so cited Silent Hill 2 as the reason that they make video games, mm -hmm. I think that's cool. And I think there's huge potential there. I, I think you hit the nail on the head with the whole Kojima thing. I think it's time to maybe for people to kind of pull back the reins on that horse. I think it's way too soon. You, you don't get the couple that, you know, broke up a month ago asking if they're going to get married <laughs> tomorrow. Like, it, it just doesn't happen that way, right? Mm -hmm. I think people need to pull the reins back on, uh, you know, Kojima doing anything Konami related right now. I think there's still some wounds that need to be healed. And I think it's time to move on past the, uh, the Kojima making Silent Hill or anything Konami related right now. I know there's, there's other rumors about Kojima doing some other things Konami related. And I just, I just don't see it. People have asked me and I was like, I, I honestly don't, I think it's too early. It's too soon. I think the, the, the breakup is still too, it's, it's still too sensitive right now. So just kind of be okay with Bluebird team doing it and not Kojima. Yes. Yes. That's, that's my thoughts. Exactly. At least give Bluebird team a chance. A lot yes. of people, you know, try to downplay their, their previous projects like the medium or, you know, layers of fear or Blair Witch and say, oh man, these guys can't put out a good game, blah, blah, blah. I don't want them touching Silent Hill. Um, for independent horror releases, they have been one of the most consistent studios. And this is a team who is going out of their way time and time again to be like, we love horror. We want to make horror games. Here's some new ideas in the horror space. And that's for me, as again, as a big horror nerd, that's why I love Bloober Team, and that's why I, I see the potential of Bloober Team. But I get it. It is not the Kojima dream. But as you touched on, as I touched on, I, I don't expect it. If, if that happens, I am going to want a documentary on how in the <laughs> hell that relationship was repaired that fast or what the sack of money looks like that got Who Kojima. Yeah, because somebody's given up something. Either yes, pride or made. a shit ton of money because that doesn't... Yep. That doesn't happen that soon. Ko Kojima didn't start a new studio to make a new IP and do one game and then jump straight back to Konami's arms. Like, I don't, I don't see that happening. I just really don't. And if I'm wrong, yeah. then so be it. I will buy whatever the Kojima PS5 Silent Hills exclusive is day one. Um, yeah. But that's not what I'm expecting right now. Um, 100%. Give a quick shout out to the amazing people that are joining us. We got you, Donnie, in the house. We got Mr. Joanna Dark. We got Eternal Umbra. We got Baron, a lot of uh, level one fam in the house. Love to see that. I'm going to get to some super chats real quick here. We got Danger Man, 1337, who says, honestly, not impressed with Battlefield 2042 beta. Um, yeah, we're going to talk a lot about Battlefield 2042's beta because I also have some, some thoughts on what I've experienced with that. Um, Mr. Joanna Dark with a super chat says, shout out to the goat and my dude, Miles Dompierre. Also, hello to today's guest, David. Also, vote for Miles Future Class 2021 the Game Awards. Do it. Second super Miles. chat, Brian yeah. Hawkins says, send Miles to the Game Awards. Vote for Miles for the Future Class 2021. Um, appreciate that. <laughs> That's love. That's love. That's man. You, you definitely... You definitely got my you and, and Lord Cognito, man. You definitely got my vote. Definitely. You deserve it. Appreciate it. Um, yes, it's not something I will ever tell anyone to do because it feels super weird to tell anyone to vote for me. But uh, there's a lot of people championing that. And it means the world that you would even consider me with all the amazing creators and all the amazing people in the industry, all the people championing games, the people who make them. Um, it's weird to see people consider me in, in you know, the, the, the fifth, top 50 potential people. So thanks hey, so much. Embrace it. Embrace it. You deserve it, man. You, you, put, you do some incredible work and um, just, you know, take it all in, man. We got you. We got Oof, you. Love, love y'all. All right. We're going to, speaking of love, we're going to transition into 20 years of Xbox, David. And it's, I got to thinking the other day, you know, I, it could you know, make me feel really old that Xbox is turning 20. Because I remember when Xbox first came out, I was, I was a skateboarding teen at this point. I was shredding up the streets. I was, you know, a teen, a, a teenager when the Xbox came out. And now Xbox is 20 years old. Xbox is 20 years old. But really, more than anything, what this has me doing is reflecting on, you know, how far the industry has come in 20 years. And that's why a big crux of today's episode is going to be breaking down the past 
present, and potential future of gaming. But before we do all of that, I wanna talk about all the stuff Xbox is doing to celebrate 20 years of Xbox, starting with those dope green Adidas. Like, oh, those are, those are nice. That collab between Xbox and Adidas for the 20th anniversary is absolutely fire. The little sizzled trailer that they did in the style of like a VHS tape mm-hmm. uh, with skateboarding, Halo and Adidas, like that was middle school for me. Halo skateboarding and Adidas, that was middle school. Rocking the three stripes, hitting the skate park, getting sweaty, coming home and playing Halo, like that was pr- <laughs> that was so important for me growing up. So it was really cool to see all of his elements come together in that promotional trailer. Mm-hmm. Um, did you get sent a pair? <laughs> come on now. Come on now. Come on now. Um, listen, I, I haven't quite yet hit that, hit that mark yet. But one day I'll, I'll be in that. I'll be in that round to be able to get sent a pair because th- those are some nice. Listen, um, Big Daddy Phil, um, <laughs> Mr. Greenberg, Sarah Bond, who again is my ultimate interview. Right? Go ahead. You know, you know my email is on my Twitter handle. You know, you want to get the address, and I wear a size. I wear a size twelve and a half. But go ahead and get that sent to me. But yeah. no, I, I don't have them. Either, either do I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm also not on that level of, of the, the elite, the Adidas elite. I saw the, uh, the marketing manager, Josh Muncy from Xbox was like, you know, bragging that he got him, had his feet kicked up on his desk at work and he's wearing the Adidas. And I'm like, oh, Josh out here flexing, flexing those Adidas, real cool, dude. And he's like, Hey, you know what? You, uh, you get a, a tattoo of these shoes and I'll send you a pair. I'm like, no, no. I don't know about that. Because <laughs> I don't know if you all have seen, but Jez Corden and I, we've thrown down the gauntlet for Xbox. We are putting our skin in the game, literally. For a long time, I've been telling Xbox and Square that if you bring Legend of Mana, you bring Secret of Mana, and you bring Trials of Mana to Xbox, I will get a Rabbite tattoo. Rabbite the mascot of, of this franchise. Jez Corden has upped the ante, and he said, Xbox, if you make Killer Instinct 2, I will get a shrimp tattoo. So Windows Central has their skin in the game. The gauntlet's been thrown down, thrown down, and the ball is in Xbox's court now. You're you're a better man than me. No. <laughs> don't don't say we're not out here doing it. All right. <laughs> hey, let's hey let's make it happen, man. Little literal skin, and see, I'm a chicken when it comes to tattoos, right? I, there's no way I would like. I'm like, yeah, let's go get one. I'm like, that hurt, and I'm done. I'm okay. Ow, 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 ow. Yeah, I got my first tattoo recently, and I got to say it hurt less than I was expecting because I had, you know, a mixed bag. I had a friend who's like, yeah, dude, it it doesn't feel like anything. Like, I fall asleep when I'm getting tattoos. And then I got another buddy who's like, dude, ask if they have the numbing stuff. Like, it hurts so bad. (laughs) Wait, that's the real thing? I didn't know you can get numbing stuff. Please tell me Miles got a tattoo of Miles, and then that Miles gets another tattoo of Miles, and we have an exception level of Miles this going on what did you get if you don't mind me asking oh uh, i've shown it off before let me see if i can get uh, some pokemon oh, nice. bro nice was it strubus strubus what's the oh yeah trubbish yes the all trubbish. the greatest yes. pokemon of all time just a Whoa. sack of trash like <laughs> oh god bless the pokemon company for bringing that vision to life <laughs> Dude, that's nice. If I, if I ever did that, I would I would do the the original, the starter three. Oh yeah, the squirrel, Commander, Bulbasaur. Yeah, that's me. I went for weird. I got Spoink, who's just a, a pig with a spring for a tail. Yes. I got Trubbish, who's a sack of trash, and then I got a Pumpkaboo, which is just a ghost pumpkin. Got the, the the shiny Spoink. The shiny Spoink is a is a beautiful Pokemon. Oh yeah, no, I'm... nice nice and gold. <laughs> There we go, Brian. Miles Inception. We need it. We need that. That's there the we, <laughs> God. I will not commit to that one. I am uh, <laughs> not, not doing that. So another part of the Xbox 20th anniversary was this amazing translucent black and green controller. Um, did you see this? Did you pre-order it? Because pre-orders went super fast on this. As the resident Xbox guy at Level 1 Gaming, I'm going to be completely honest when I tell you, I've never been a fan of the translucent controller. <gasps> no, no. I was beyond no. disappointed when I saw it was translucent. And that killed my hype for the controller. <sighs> I was so excited. 
when they was teasing it and I was like, oh yeah, I'm getting this no matter what. And I saw Translucent and I was like, oh, dude. Th- <sighs> but I'm still going to get it. The pre-order <laughs> is in effect. I'm, just, I'm not a fan of the Translucent, but I'm still going to get it because <sighs> you have to have that controller. So yes, the pre-order is in full effect. Even though I'm not a fan of the Translucent part of it, it's 20 years of Xbox, right? It's 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 iconic in a way for a lot of reasons for me, and it it had it had to happen. So yes, that will be here. It may never be opened. It may never be played. Like as you can see, my Sea of Thieves controller in the box, never been Ooh. taken out the box, never Ooh. played. Um, that 20th anniversary controller would be right there next to it. It'll never be used, but I have to have it. Yes, that controller for me, as a fan of Translucent, I was stoked. When they were doing the teases, I was in the Xbox thread saying, if this is a neon green Translucent controller, I'm going to scream. It wasn't quite that. It wasn't that iconic like Halo Translucent green. That would have, in my opinion, been the best possible 20th anniversary controller. But the Translucent black with the neon green grips was still pretty sweet. So I didn't pre-order it. Because my wife has been like harassing me about what I want for Christmas already. And I'm like, I don't know. I, I really don't know. And then as soon as I saw that, I was like, shot her the link. I'm like, hey, this is what I want. <laughs> By the way, you it got is. like a couple hours to get this. So The headset as well? Not the headset. The just, just the controller. The controller, again, I'm torn. I have my Sea of Thieves controller sealed. Not, I won't play with that, but I'll probably play with this one. I'm not going to lie. That's the best controller they ever did. Dude, that is the greatest limited edition it controller ever goat. made. It is the, go- the That's why it sells for li- literally thousands of dollars. That sealed controller, you could go on yep. eBay and you can get a couple grand. I've been tempted. Mm-hmm. I've been te- I've been tempted, but at the same time, that controller it's so good. And I had to work yeah. so hard to get it. I had to like that thing sold out so fast. I had to look so many places and when I finally locked it down, I was like, "Oh, yes." It's it's such a good controller. It's 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 the greatest Microsoft Xbox controller. I would love for them to bring it back, but with the the share button and because I tried to play with an an Xbox One controller, I tried to go back to it, and that made me realize this is not the same controller as we're playing with today. It feels different. Like they really make those subtle tweaks that made this the the new controller the perfect controller to where I can't even use the old controllers anymore. It feels weird. But it, I, I would love a re re this that controller. You you bring up an excellent point because I feel the exact same way. It's when they first revealed that controller, we're like, that's the same controller. Like they changed mm-hmm. the D pad. Like, okay, cool. They changed the D pad, added a share button. But when you feel it, there's all these tiny little tweaks and changes to the feel, the bumpers. I love how clicky everything feels. That D pad mm-hmm. and those bumpers feel so great. The triggers are, are aligned slightly differently. So there are all these subtle tweaks that really kind of make the controller shine and it makes me not want to touch. And I have like eight Xbox One controllers. <laughs> like I have a ton. Oh, man. <laughs> and I, I don't want to touch them. I, I don't. Like I, I have a couple of the new Xbox controllers and they are so much better. And it's so like, much better. It, it's so weird that just those subtle changes make a world of difference. Xbox has also done a really good job of making me spend way too much money on dumb stuff I don't need for this 20th anniversary. Um, recently, I bought the that OG Xbox hoodie. Did you, did you see that? Like the original. I didn't see that, Miles. Oh my God. Now I have to find that. Yeah, look because... on the merch store. Look up the, the like, the, it's got the original Xbox logo on it. Oh, so beautiful. So I, I I didn't see that, but now I want it. Do, do they come in size big? Because that's the one I need. I will, yes, I am fairly confident they do. I don't know what availability looks like right now, but when I was looking, I think it went up to 4X. Ooh, um, that's nice. So they got some, they got some op. Oh, it's, ah. Uh, so yeah, you're going to get me in trouble, dude. My wife just walked in. I'm like, what are you doing? Like buying stuff because Miles told me that I needed it. <laughs> it's bad. It's but it is awesome to see Xbox kind of reaching this point. Obviously, PlayStation and Nintendo have been around longer. So we've had those big moments and we've had the merch and these collectibles released to be excited about and to see Xbox hit this milestone and, and do something really special. Uh, it means a lot as again, I play everywhere, but I prefer Xbox. And as an Xbox console heathen, it's it feels so good to see Xbox at Target, to see Xbox, yeah. you know, like in the mainstream in a big way. And I, I you know, 
Xbox has come up in a lot of ways, and it, it feels really good to see. You know, buy American is what I say. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I totally agree because you can you walk in most stores, any stores, and you're going to see a PlayStation hoodie. You're going to see PlayStation um, pins. You know, and you, you see this stuff like literally everywhere. So it's nice to finally be able to, you know, go and see that Xbox merch and see people wearing the Xbox merch because we're fans. Of, I mean, there, there's no, there's no, we don't, we don't hide it, right? We are fans of a product. We are, we are fans of Microsoft. We're fans of Xbox, right? So I want to be able to wear that, that Xbox hood if somebody, if somebody else walk by and say, yeah, that's it. And I, yeah. that, that's, that's a great feeling, right? Know someone else that's like into the the xbox brand as, as you are because i know some people try to shame you for but it's nothing wrong with lo- liking what we like and we like xbox so it's good to be able to go inside a store and see that xbox merchandise exactly the, the first time i saw a xbox t-shirt at target i bought it instantly no hesitation mm-hmm. whatsoever because i constantly see playstation and i constantly see nintendo like every mm-hmm. time i go to any store there's playstation stuff there's nintendo stuff there's never been Xbox, but never. in the past year, there's been this big push, and I've seen Xbox shirts at, at Target, Xbox shirts at, at Walmart, and it's like, has Xbox finally made it? Are they, are they in the space now in the same way as PlayStation and Nintendo? And it's, it feels good. It feels really good to see, and I got to give you know, the marketing team a huge shout out because obviously they've been putting in the work to make sure people see the Xbox brand. People mm-hmm. respect the Xbox brand, and that's, that's awesome. I got to give a quick shout out to the 140 people rocking with us right now. You guys are digging the show. Hit that like button. Share it out. If you're new to the show, we are live every Saturday at 12 p.m. Eastern. So what I want to know, David, is with all of this 20th anniversary celebration, is Xbox going to do some kind of social or community focused event on November 15th? I've been sitting... And, and thinking about this over the last couple of days because it's it's getting close. We're we're about a month out, uh, two months for the year is over, and of course we're in this this world that we all hate to be in at the moment due to the pandemic. And I really hope so, Miles. I just you you got to announce it pretty soon if it's going to happen. I mean, we're getting close. Um, I I do think they will not. I know, I know I got, I did that sentence in the wrong way, but I don't think so. Uh, I would love for there to be. I do think Microsoft is using the other shows, other things that's happening to really showcase what they want to do. It's just kind of, it, it would be weird for me to, for them to have some type of event to show. And then the very next month, we're going to, then, then we're going to see uh, gameplay of Hellblade and things of that such. Uh, I could see maybe something small that's not that that's, that's not necessarily has to do with like announcements. Uh, maybe it's a recap of uh, things that maybe happened this year, recap of the twenty years. Um, but I think that's going to upset a lot of people because when you think when they think Xbox event, they want new news. They want they want to hear about the new hotness. And I think if they was to do a show, it wouldn't necessarily be about anything that's forthcoming. And with how in tune they are or they have been over the last few years with gamers, I think they will realize that we're going to upset a lot of people if we don't have a show that we show what's what's next, the next Gears, the next Hellblade, um, show more of a vow. And I don't think that, I don't think November 15th, right before um, the Video Games Award, right towards the end of the year, right before Halo Infinite, um, I don't think that's going to happen. I, hey, I refuse the right to be wrong. Always, I just don't see it happening. Would love for it to. I'm just, I wouldn't hedge my bets. You bring up an excellent point with the Game Awards because a lot of us have talked about kind of our expectations from Xbox at the Game Awards and the expectations that Xbox has set at the Game Awards. They they revealed n- not only the new Xbox console but Hellblade Two at the Game Awards. They mm-hmm. they've had Perfect Dark reveal at the Game Awards. Xbox sees value in Jeff's show and they are going to have some big stuff to show. So it would be weird to have a November showcase, no, November 15th showcase packed with new reveals, packed with gameplay, and then a couple weeks later have the Game Awards with, with new reveals and gameplay. But there's been this kind of speculation and, you know, conversation about Halo. 20, Halo, Halo also turns 20 the same day as the mm-hmm. Xbox One does. That was a launch title for the original Xbox. 
So maybe we see a celebration of 20 years of Xbox, and that's capped off with a campaign, a new campaign trailer for Halo. Because people have been clamoring for that campaign gameplay. They want to see something because the last time we really saw it in a big way was that Rigged. infamous showcase that was <laughs> panned by some people for its graphical presentation. So people want to see it. We need to quiet the kind of concerns and criticisms of Halo Infinite's campaign. And that mm -hmm. would be a great way to do that and showcase that. But I, I kind of agree that we won't see a bunch of quote unquote bangers and, and new reveals on the 15th. You know, like, like I said, uh, something to reminisce and go back about the 20 years of Xbox that I think that's, and what the great thing about Microsoft, um, and especially Aaron Greenberg, is that they will not hesitate to set expectations. And that's the good part about if, if there is a show that they'll come out and say, hey, we're not going to see any new reveals. Yeah. And that keeps people from being upset, because if you do not do that, then people are going to say, where is Avowed? Where was the Outer Worlds? Where is, you know, Compulsion's next game? Why didn't we see Hellblade 2? And, and that's, that's a, a, a snowball effect that's not good. Because the Xbox brand is, is going uphill. They, they've been going uphill for the past few years. They haven't really made any mistakes. Um, the PR team has been perfect. Their social media team deserves a raise, right? Oh, they're they, they deserve killing it. Absolute yeah. raise, right? Um, so if there is a show, I do hope they temper expectations. I would love to see that Halo game because I, I am, Miles, I'll be honest with you, I am so scared that we're going to get a Halo Infinite multiplayer only release. I'm so scared of that, right? I'm so scared of the, the campaign. And I know a lot of people have that same fear that the story will maybe get pushed back because we haven't seen anything since Craig. And mind you, that that showcasing wasn't bad to me. I didn't go in and saying, oh, let me zoom in 40 times on Craig's <laughs> nose to see if if there's a, a polygon out of out of order, out of place, right? I think it's overblown the visuals of what we saw in Halo Infinite. But, you know, it's it's Microsoft's right to kind of pull back and say, okay, we're going to kind of hide our hand a little bit and kind of improve things as much as we can before we show it again. Um, like I said, there is a fear that the, that the story, because Halo multiplayer is where it's at for a lot of people. I'm a campaign person, not a big multiplayer person when it comes to Halo. I love the campaign. I love the story of Halo. Uh, so I do hope we get to see that campaign, and I hope we get to see it soon because I want it there day one. Yeah, I, I was kind of in the same camp when, when we saw that first gameplay reveal. I was watching with a really good friend of mine, somebody we grew up to playing Halo together. We have this long history and relationship founded upon, you know, playing co-op, enjoying these games together. When we saw that first gameplay reveal, we were excited. We saw the grappling mm -hmm. hook. We saw the big scale of the world. We're like, yeah, this looks awesome. This looks like, you know, an improvement to the classic Halo formula we know and love. Then I went on Twitter and I was like, oh no, people are not excited about this. Yikes, that is that is sad to see. So mm -hmm. while I was, you know, wasn't that concerned graphically, I am very happy in, in hindsight that they took that time and they took the time to polish it. Because, you know, if the multiplayer lights are any any indication of how the game is going to look and feel, then even if the story of in Halo campaign is poo, just absolutely dumb nonsense it will at least be fun to play. It'll at least mm -hmm. look good. So that's kind of where I'm at. I'm not going to comment really on how I expect the, the campaign to be until I've played it at this point. Yeah. Um, I respect that. So until I get my hands on it, until I've had time to really see what this is, uh, I'm, I'm excited about the glimpses they've shown us of the storytelling, having those mm -hmm. dramatic moments with the pilot, having the dramatic moments of Chief kind of slowly floating through space, gently moving a soldier to the side. Like there's been elements that tell me that this could be a great Halo story. Um, but again, where I'm at right now is the game looks good. The game feels incredible. So, you know, if the story's whatever, then at least it'll be fun <laughs> at the end of the day. You know, I think that's, it was super smart when we first heard the rumors of the multiplayer being free to play. I was like, that's really smart because you're gonna get, you're gonna have that competition for the Fortnite and the Call of Duties mm -hmm. of the world. Um, but I, I think I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum. I think that campaign has to, at bare minimum, make up for five. I I, I enjoyed five multiplayer way more than I enjoyed the story because I was so deep into the lore of Halo Five before it released, and the build up to the the fight between Locke and and Master Chief. I was like. 
Yeah, it was like punch, punch. Who are you, kid? Go to sleep. And Chief walks away. Like it was. Yeah. That was such a big build up. I listened to all the tapes. I listened to everything I could. I was like, this is exciting. And it, it didn't live up to expectations for me personally. It's my opinion. So I think that campaign has to be above and beyond five, uh, in my opinion. I think the multiplayer is. You don't have to worry about the multiplayer. The multiplayer is going to be great, right? Mm -hmm. As long as they continue to say they don't pull in Avengers with the XP boost and they and everything is strictly cosmetic only, it's going to be amazing. Just don't all of a sudden hit us with XP boosters because that's a surefire way of killing the community. Yeah, that's it's very divisive. It. But you're not alone when it comes to Halo 5. Halo has a you know has built an expansive world of lore even outside of the the core games. Um, mm -hmm. the novels, people love the world of Halo, love the stories of Halo. So I understand that Halo Infinite has the potential and should hopefully deliver one of the best stories Halo has seen. There's, there's no reason it shouldn't with everything surrounding it, with all the time they've had to kind of flesh out these ideas and, you know, trim down the campaign to a tight, great story. Um, so I really hope it's that. I, I want it to be that. And like I said, the glimpses that we've seen show us that there is absolutely a chance that this is an incredible story. People always mm -hmm. point to Halo Wars 2 right now as, as like the best Halo story. People love Halo Wars 2. And like if Halo Infinite just borrows a page out of that book, we'll be stoked. So I want to yeah. see them take the classic Halo formula, but improve the story, improve the lore in, in, a, in a meaningful way. And I think they can do it. I think they can do it. I think they will do it. Um, but we'll have to just stay tuned. Not much longer now. <laughs> no, I'm a, we're, I'm a, and I said this, I was on a podcast uh, Unlocked with, with Ryan McCaffrey and those guys. And I said it there and I'll say it again. I think this is the halo to where we, 343 makes us forget about Bungie. And we those cries for Bungie to come back and take over Halo will be done. Because I have a lot of faith in 343 and what I've seen so far it looks great. And this is this will be the game that three four three finally puts their stamp on and says this is our Halo. I love that. I love because we've seen that with Gears Four. We saw that with Halo Four as well, where these these new teams come in and maybe they're scared to take risks or you know what whatever the case might be, they don't make it their own. It feels like mm -hmm. another Gears. It feels like another Halo, um, but things aren't quite the same as we knew. So. I want Halo Infinite to be the new kickoff point for Halo. And I don't mm -hmm. want the obsession with with the past and what Bungie did for Halo to be clouded over 343 for everything that they do with Halo moving forward. So I'm with you. I love that message. I want to see 343 just stick this landing mm -hmm. in every possible way and give n no one any fuel to criticize what they've done with Halo. Like That is my dream for Halo Infinite, for it to come out and everyone just to have so much fun playing with playing it that we don't even hear any any major criticisms of the game like that is the dream for me 100 percent. i'm gonna get to a couple super chats real quick we got yo donnie with a tragic story here who says i have a sea of thieves controller but i unsealed it and put it on the matching stand but an airbnb guest of ours used it and ripped the thumbsticks dude did you get can you can you review guests in Airbnb, did you give them like a one star, permanently ban them from the service forever, or what? That is, we got a fight, bro. Like, wow, <coughs> wow. that is that's pain. Wow, dude. they ripped the thumbsticks on the sea of the greatest special edition controller ever made. My Pour heart one out. hurts for you. Pour one out, dude. <laughs> wow. Oh, Harjeet Chani says Xbox should do a weekend thing and start on the twelfth. That would be fun. What what I want, and I don't know that this is gonna happen. But what I want more than anything is for them to release a campaign demo. Remember mm -hmm. when we first saw that gameplay for Halo Infinite? Mm -hmm. And it said, press start to begin demo. Remember that little, that little screen there? That seemed very intentional to me. That seemed incredibly intentional. So what I want to see is that that campaign demo launch that weekend. And that would be, oh. That would be the ultimate like celebration of 20 years of Halo in my eyes. And that would, you know, like like the Halo flights. Maybe once people get their hands on the campaign, they go, damn, this is fun. This is awesome. This is fun. I'm that excited. Part. Let's go. Let's because they've done an amazing job giving us the game, putting the game in our hands. And that silences any concerns or criticisms that anyone's had with multiplayer. Yep. Like people played and like, damn, this feels good. 
I'm I'm ready. Let's go. Like I'm jonesing for more Halo Infinite multiplayer <laughs> after those flights. I want it. I need it in my hands now. Um, so yeah, like if they do the same thing with campaign and it really hits whew, that hype train, baby, you do that three weeks before the game comes out. Let's go, dude. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> we got a super chat from kids. Smooth. What up, dude? Real, dude. Says, what's up miles and fame. Great. Listen, hope y'all having a great weekend. You too. I'm having an excellent weekend. Um, so I got to sit and talk to David about video games. That's, that's beautiful. Beautiful. All right. So. Another part of the conversations surrounding this anniversary and 20 years of Xbox are backwards compatibility titles. We've gone a, a huge stretch without any OG Xbox or Xbox 360 backwards compatibility titles being added to the program. Uh, there's a, a very vocal group of people who are demanding more. We need more OG Xbox. We need more Xbox 360 games. Um, Nick of Xbox era and a few others have kind of suggested that there's an incoming batch and we actually have a list of i think five games six games yeah six games here that could potentially be coming and that is dead or alive three full spectrum warrior chicken little uh gladius advent rising and gun valkyrie uh since then nick of xbox era has said that you know his source has heard that there's more than this that these titles are here but there could potentially be more so what i want to know david is are you excited about these titles? And what is your dream? What are your dream OG Xbox, Xbox 360 ads for backwards compatibility? Well, I don't know if you knew this, but you know Chicken Little is the greatest video game ever made. The, oh, damn. A, oh, no, I, I, I didn't even know that was a Chicken Little game, right? <laughs> I had no idea. So this list, uh, I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Maybe I'll hop into a little bit Dead of a Lot 3, even though I, I suck at fighters. It is a classic game. Uh, Gun Valkyrie. Definitely would check it out. But for me, and tell me if I'm wrong, right? Because I'm not versed on what the entire list of backwards compatible games are. But Jetset Radio Future did something for me that I haven't felt in the game in a long time, right? Like, give me give me some Jetset Radio, uh, Jetset Radio Future. Um, I need that in my life. I don't I don't think it's on the list. I don't think it's playable, but let me have it, right? Yes. Because I love that game. And then, of course, um, Jade Empire, man. Like you can't go wrong with some Jade Empire. Let's make these games backwards compatible. But but my, my number one, I would play it all day long, and you couldn't get me off of it. It's some Jet Set Radio. Such a classic game. So much fun. Love the music. Love the grinding. Love everything about that game. I would love to play that right now, um, in 120 FPS if possible. <laughs> <laughs> Jet Set Radio Future, dude. That was one of the very first games I got on the original Xbox. It was Halo Combat Evolved, it was Hunter the Reckoning, and it was that double disc of like GT 2002 and Jet Set Radio Future. Yes. And yes. I was like, I was blown away by Jet Set Radio Future when I first played that. So I would love to see that be part of the program. Um, of the games that are listed here, a, a standout for me and a game that did not get enough love at launch was Gladius. Imagine Final Fantasy Tactics meets Gladiator. It is this like turn-based tactics game set in, in, in arenas as gladiators. And oh my, it was so good. I played so many hours of that game. I remember, you know, staying up to like 6 a.m. with some buddies, just like taking turns, passing the controller for our characters. And it's, it's, just, it's a huge standout for me. But a couple big question marks that I have is, where's Otagi? Otagi Myth of Demons was a From Software Xbox exclusive. Incredible. They made two games on the original Xbox that nobody's even heard about. This was back before, you know, From Software did Dark Souls and blew up, but From, so From Software was still making incredible games, and these games are amazing. And they are Xbox exclusives that are not backwards compatible. And why? Why Xbox? Like, let more people play that. And then let's, you know, now that From Software is this legendary, iconic studio, Let's get them back on board to, for Otagi 3. Let's go. Let's do it. I want to see that. Another one, Castlevania Curse of Darkness. Um, that's an original Xbox Castlevania 3D open world kind of... Sim it's basically like a poor man's 3D Symphony of the Night. Like they tried, they tried really hard to make Symphony of the Night. It didn't quite land, but it's still a cool game. And there are pretty much every other 
Castlevania that existed on Xbox is backwards compatible. So that's kind of the, mm-hmm. the one omission in that portfolio that I want to see, see closed. Um, anyone in the chat, if you guys have any other recommendations, anything else you want to see, drop them in, in there. Uh, Kid Smooth actually has one here. We got FPS boost to Xbox 360 games. Backwards compatibility wish list is Quake 4, Wet, Stranglehold, Max Payne 3, and Full Auto. Max I Payne. I love Wet. Uh, what, yeah, Wet. Wet was a weird one that kind of like came out to no fanfare whatsoever. None. I like, loved it. I loved every second of it. It, it wasn't the greatest game. I, I had so much fun with Wet. I would love to to get wet um you know at higher frames i would love to have that comeback man it's such a good game for me everybody yeah. else hated it i'd never played it <laughs> like it's one of those games that i remember coming out and then i remember no one talking about it so i know in hindsight a lot of people are talking about it online like oh man that was such a good game nobody played it um mm-hmm. so it'd be cool to to get a chance to revisit that max pain 3 what's the deal there why isn't Max Payne 3 backwards compatible? That game is so damn good. Well, I, I know why. They're going to resell it to us at some point. There but, you um, go. <laughs> there it is. That's, uh, you know, take two, trying to get a little piece, as we saw with the Grand Theft Auto trilogy, y'all. One more time with feeling. Let's do mm. it. Mm. How, many, uh, how many times are they going to re-release these? I mean, it's, again, it's the Skyrim philosophy. They only do it because people buy it. They're only there do- it is. We have nothing, no one to blame but ourselves because instead of us getting the new toy, they just like spit shine the old one. You're like, oh yeah, I forgot you were fun. And we just go back to it, right? Uh-huh. It's our own fault. And to hear that it's going to still be and look like the, the classic, it's going to have that classic feel to it. I'm like, give me, if you want to say we remade San Andreas, oh, I'd be the Ooh. first person in line. Be the first person in line. I'm all there for it. Uh, even though it's they're just re- rehashing things and not giving us, you know, the next GTA, I'm I'll still buy it. But it's our own fault. We complain about things that we do, and this uh-huh. is another one. I'm covering. We're all going to buy it, and then complain that the next GTA isn't out yet. It's our own fault. It's our own fault. So. Exactly. We have no one to blame but ourselves. You know, as much as I criticize stuff like that, every now and then a game comes out where I'm like, oh, we're Alan Wake remastered. <laughs> oh, what? I'm <laughs> I'm buying that day one. <laughs> So, yeah, we're all hypocrites to some degree there. <laughs> all right. What I want to transition into now is, is kind of a, an interesting overall conversation that I want to have with you and the people watching. And that is the current state of, of the big three. So what we're going to be doing for this sa- section here is we're going to be highlighting the good, the bad, and the ugly right now for PlayStation, Nintendo, and Xbox. And we're going to transition that conversation into, you know, what the future of gaming looks like. So first and foremost, this is an Xbox show. So we got to start with Xbox. And I'll start with you, David. Okay. Highlight right now your favorite things about the Xbox platform. Uh, favorite things about the Xbox platform. Number one, Xbox Game Pass. Um, best deal in gaming, can't, baby. It's, it's the best deal in gaming. Um, the other day I was out and I had, I have a dedicated controller in the clip, uh, and I have my phone I'm playing the Avengers, uh, mobile. Uh, you can't, you can't go wrong with Xbox game pass. It, it is the best deal in gaming. Um, I absolutely, I absolutely love what they're doing with the, I guess you could say current, not the future, the current studio acquisitions, uh, because you can see where they're going with, Hey, we're going to have different sorts of games and you're going to find something about a particular studio that you're going to fall in love with and you're going to be fans of this right um if you're you're into the you know the fallout sort of games and you know and you say new vegas was your favorite one hey by the way obsidian is 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 making you know games so you have those studios there i i absolutely love you know everything you're doing about the platform i love the consoles itself i have both the series x and the series s i'm not gonna lie i bought the series s just because I've played it twice, <laughs> but you you can't go wrong. Like when you want to play, you want to play the games with the highest fidelity, at the highest frame rate possible on console. So you go with the Series X. It's such a powerful machine. Um, I love the games that are that are currently in Game Pass or are currently out for the platform. Like I so said, we got Halo right around the corner. Uh, I went back and played Gears High Busters. It's, High Busters is probably the most beautiful game on consoles. Absolutely. Mm. Period. Mm. We mentioned that before. That controller. Uh, I I held the dual sense. I don't have a PlayStation Five, uh, but the Xbox controller, this new controller, feels 
so much better than the previous controller. To me, it is the best controller out right now. Um, it, it's, it's hard to find things wrong with the console at the moment. The console itself, the brand itself, it's all hitting on point. Uh, but the number one thing, obviously, I said once, it's it's, it's Game Pass. I, I think my Game Pass subscription ends like 2023. <laughs> <laughs> Something of that sort, right? Uh, there are so many games that are consistently being added daily. If you're a gamer and you want to play games, you want to play a different assortment amount of games, and you don't want to be held back and restricted to 60 here, 60 here, 70 here, 70 there, and you got these games coming into Game Pass, you know, consistently as they are, including Xbox first-party titles, it's an absolute win. You can't go wrong with that. So I find myself tied up with so many games, and the revival of certain games, right? The Avengers, which I have days in, right? Days has a revival because of Game Pass, right? A revival. And people like to like to harp on, what about the game? Everyone's talking about, about our hardware. What Game Pass is, that's about the games. You know, it's, you can't go wrong with it. And I'm, I know I'm rambling, but it's, that is the number one thing about the Xbox brand right now is Game Pass. And Microsoft knows it. Yes. Um, Xbox has done an amazing job marketing Xbox Game Pass, building Xbox Game Pass, and slowly but surely spelling a lot of the criticisms and concerns revolving the service. They are using the, the Netflix model, quite frankly, as a metric to show you that if you have a huge diverse portfolio of content and you make content that people like and are excited about, they are gonna stay subscribed. They're gonna tell their mm -hmm. friends to subscribe. Their friends are gonna talk about what they're playing on social media. And before it was like, dude, I don't know if I want to spend 60 bucks, 60 bucks. It's a lot. Like, let's not downplay it. I hate when people downplay the, the cost of video games and say, gaming's an expensive hobby. Sorry, stop. That doesn't, that doesn't have to be the case. As we've seen with music, as we've seen with movies, you used to have to buy movies all the card. Nobody, nobody does that anymore. Like people nope. still buy movies and support them every now and then, but that's not your main way of consuming and absorbing films and i love what game pass has done to made make games m more available to more people for, for less mm -hmm. i i have friends that haven't played video games in a long time because of that cost factor they're like i don't want to pay 500 bucks for a console and then drop 60 70 bucks a pop to play a game on top of you know my online subscription of playstation plus or xbox live gold like i don't really care but now that they see like, oh, damn, I can just pay for Game Pass and I can either play on my PC or I can play on my phone. Um, like it has opened up gaming to so many more people. And mm -hmm. I, I love that. I love that about Xbox's ecosystem. I love that Xbox gets it. They get what the, the customer wants and they're going to where they're going. They're not saying, sorry, you want to play this? You buy our box. You buy this title here. You play it here. That's it. You have no other options. We don't care. Like if you want to play this game, you're going to buy it here. And that's the end of the story. That's the end of the conversation. We're not going to humor any other possibilities. Xbox understands that if you go to where the people are, people are going to be more, not only more receptive of, of it, but they're going to be more willing to support it and celebrate it because it celebrates exactly. their preferences. You don't have to play on a console anymore. Like I'm a console heathen. I will keep playing on consoles until the day that they fade into obscurity. But I understand that not everyone does that. And now that we have crossplay, Xbox is pushing crossplay between PC and Xbox in a huge way and making sure that all of their biggest first party titles, for the most part, outside of the RTS games, are, are launching on Xbox and PC with crossplay. So you can play mm -hmm. with your friends who are PC edge lords who have to play in 4K. 400 FPS, even though their monitor can't output 400 FPS. They just like looking at the big numbers. We can all play games together. And, and, and I love that. Um, I also love that Xbox is working incredibly hard to diversify their portfolio. And they are being very smart with their acquisitions. As much as there's, you know, criticism levied saying that Xbox is just buying up anyone and everyone they possibly can. They have shown us that that's not the case. They have no interest in doing that. They want to make sure that any team that they get is not only a good fit for them, but a fit for that studio as well. Obsidian Entertainment recently came out and talked about how they had an offer, free Xbox. Somebody was trying to buy Obsidian. And they said, no, nah, no. Nah. Like, we want to partner with somebody that we can sit down and have a beer with, was their quote. And I, I love hearing that because business as someone who comes from the corporate sales world, climbed the corporate ladder, worked in, in the boring sales world, it's... 
at a certain point you lose the the kind of human connection of it all and i love that xbox at least on the surface they've maintained that i can look at the people at xbox and i can tell that you know sure they're trying to make money sure they're running a business sure they're running one of the biggest businesses in the world but they're still able to stay human and they're still able mm. to recognize what makes games special, what makes the individuals who make games special. And I love that. It's not just a brand. There's, there's personality. There's, there's heart to it, David. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the most, I think underrated things that's uh, coming out that's is happening is, you know, how us, when we got our series X and series S, we pretty much stopped playing our other Xbox consoles. Oh right? yes. Hard, well, hard let's drop. Say, so this is this is one of my one X's. I, I think I had two of them, and I have a one S here, and I have an OG, the Fat Boy still can't get rid of that. The one of the beauty the beauties about that is if you don't if you you say you know what I maybe I feel burned I don't want to go and buy a Series X, but I want to be able to play Hellblade two. Well, guess what? You're gonna be able to stream Hellblade two on your one X via X Cloud, and so you you're not there. No one's being left behind. Right, you want to think, oh, this game isn't, it's not playable on the Xbox One. Well, you'd be able to stream it on that Xbox One through the browser via X Cloud, which is now fully updated to the Xbox Series X. Mm -hmm. it, it's 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 a beautiful concept, and no one they feel said it before. We're not leaving no one behind, and he meant it. If you have an Xbox One, you have an Xbox One X, and you want to be able to play Hellblade Two, which we're all assuming will be next gen only you get to play it if you don't have a next gen console because microsoft is dedicated to its gamer that hey we don't care what you have if it has the capability of doing x cloud or game pass you will be able to play your games and that's so underrated yeah there's so much value there uh got to give a quick shout out to the 170 people rocking with us i see colt eastwood in the chat um oh. if you guys are digging the show Hit that like button, share it out. If you are new to the show, we are live every Saturday at 12 p.m. Eastern time. So now that we've talked about all of the positives of Xbox, all the reasons that we really like the Xbox platform, we got to have the hard conversation. We got to talk about areas improvement, areas of improvement for Xbox. Right now, as it stands, brutal, brutal truth here. What do you think Xbox needs to do to improve its platform? It's, it's it's kind of twofolded because the one thing you look into, you say, oh, the first party titles. Well, they have the studios for the first party titles. It just so happens that the games aren't here yet. So it's kind of twofold. Like you don't want them to just, all right, now y'all are here, put it, put out a bunch of games. You you want to give those studios time to craft and develop and make the art that we love so much. But because to me, that is the one true downfall you could say is okay where are the true big first party titles where are they you got all these studios but these games aren't out uh they've had double find this release was possibly game of the year uh but that isn't that big exclusive you know triple a title that everyone harps on so much even i think triple a is overrated right you can you can look at a game like psycho notch 2 and it's not that big triple a title but it's still a game of the year contender um so it's twofold because the only downside to the platform you can say is those those titles aren't here, but if they're they aren't here yet. They're coming, but they're not here right now. If I'm being honest, and people can call me, you know, a fanboy, that that is the only pitfall of the brand. Like I said before, they're on an upswing. Everything they're they're doing, they're doing it correctly as far as you know the hardware, uh, the software. PR, uh, what they're doing on social media, everything has been absolutely great. And I can't seem to find a downfall besides the first party titles aren't here yet. That is the only thing. Yes, there, that is a big conversation amongst, you know, especially hardcore PlayStation fans who, you know, use that as a reason that they don't quote unquote need an Xbox is that they don't have mm -hmm. those must have big exclusives. They've been doing a really good job correcting that, especially in recent years. And they've shown us a really good picture of what that is going to look like and how they're going to rectify that. But for a while, that was a legitimate criticism. They, mm -hmm. they had a very sparse first party output and a lot of their first party output was not must play games. Like I love Gears of War. Like Gears of War to me is one of my all time favorite franchises. Um, 
you know, it's hard for me to say that every single Gears of War game is a must play for everyone. Um, so I agree that that is, that is a big, you know, point of contention. I think games like Fable, Avowed, Starfield, uh, Perfect Dark, Hellblade 2 are going, once those land, I hope that, that kind of quell, that, I hope that quells that criticism. And they yeah. see these games, they hit, they play amazingly. Like, okay, Xbox does have the, the bangers. I, I, <laughs> I love that word. I hate that word. It's, it's, it, but it is important. It is really important to a lot of people to have those must plays that everyone wants to talk about. Um, a big issue that. Defin- sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. I will say you brought up bang. I think the, the, the problem is the definition of bangers change too often. Bangers, 96, now people are saying that 86 is a banger. Now 82 is a banger. That's why the word sucks, because the definition changes so often. I'm sorry for cutting you off. I no, it's... To, you know, you're fine. You're, you're good with not using the... Not want to use the word, because the definition changes so much <laughs> because of the community. But a huge area that I have a problem with with Xbox right now is Xbox tells us that they want to be the best place to play. No matter who you are, what games you love, Xbox is going to be the best platform to play on. I want that to be the reality. I want that to be the dream for anyone and everyone so I can tell my friends, no matter what they play, no matter what they like, that Xbox is where it's at. Xbox is where you need to be. But we keep seeing, time and time again, games go to every single platform but Xbox. And that's a problem. That's a, that's a red flag. Uh, it's it, JRPGs are a huge point of contention for a lot of people. A lot of big JRPGs skip. The Mana games, as I talked about earlier, why aren't they on Xbox? That series is beloved by so many people. It's so big in Japan, but there's no, like Square doesn't even care. Like they don't see any marketing potential or any reason to bring those games to Xbox. So they don't. They just don't. And that's, you know, some of it's, some people say that Square's evil. And that's, that's the reason. That's the sole reason. Square hates Xbox. Square hates Xbox players. But Square is a business. Square is looking at what it costs to make a port. And they're looking at the potential sales on Xbox. And they are saying that it's not even worth it for us to do that. And that sucks. Oxenfree 2, a more recent example, uh, a game that, you know, came out on Xbox in a big way, garnered a big following garnered a lot of critical reception on Xbox, was in Game Pass for a long time. The sequel, Oxenfree 2, launching on every single platform but Xbox. That hurt. I I asked them, you know, why? And they're just like, you know, we had to prioritize for launch. We had to, based on our resources, based on, you know, what we thought was the best choice for the game, we had to prioritize for launch. And so they are basically saying that it wasn't in the best interest of their studio to bring the game out on Xbox at launch. Like, that's a problem. That is a huge problem. We cannot ignore that. And Xbox has been working incredibly hard to correct that. They, they really have. And I cannot downplay the work that that team and the partnership team has done to bridge that gap, correct it, and make people understand the value of bringing it to Xbox. But the more that that happens, the more we're going to see other publishers and developers go, you know, maybe I don't need an Xbox version of this game. Or maybe, maybe if I feel like it, I'll bring it a year or two later. Um, when we have some more resources after the game sells on other platforms. You know what I think, Miles? I think one thing uh, that would help uh, in the Japanese market uh, is what they're doing with Redfall, Starfield, the localization, right? When watching uh, Tokyo Game Show, I was I was shocked to see the full localization support uh, for Redfall, for Starfield. And I think that's big for them to show the Japanese market, hey, we're here, we're serious. Uh, and then hopefully that will in turn get the the support. I mean, I know consoles in general aren't as big in Japan. If you notice doing Tokyo Games, I don't think they show the Xbox console itself one time during TGS. I don't remember seeing the console once. It was all they were all on their phones. They showed the controller. They were on different screens. Uh, the guy was at work on his laptop with his PlayStation controller. It was all about Game Pass and all about saying, "Hey, we don't really care about if you buy the box." get into the service. And I'm hoping that these de- these Japanese developers uh, that's making these JRPGs can say, hey, maybe uh, our old mantra of thinking that making this support for the box is not worth it, but hey, maybe make it a port, but not only if it's for the box, it's for this Xbox Game Pass service, and it's gonna be across multiple platforms, mobile, laptop, and everything. So I'm, I'm hoping that 
will help change the conversation around that with them going and doing the localization and them really pushing, hey, you can play these games on your phone. You don't need to play it on the on the on the console. So go ahead and bring the JRPG over the Game Pass, and I promise you, our subscribe. We're gonna cut you a check. You wanna get that check, and I promise you, our gamers are going to, at bare minimum, try your game out, and then that leads to, as has been proven, that leads to the game actually selling. So you're gonna make more on top of that. It all revolves around Game Pass. Exactly. Yeah, Xbox, as we've seen with franchises like Yakuza, Dragon Quest. That is their way to introduce it to the Xbox audience. And that is their way to prove that if these games come to Xbox, there will be engagement, which again, that's kind of becoming the new metric for success for a lot of these is like that that engagement factor. Sales mm -hmm. obviously still important, but people want to know that if they're bringing it to the platform, they're going to play it. They're going to talk about it. So to make this a compliment sandwich for Xbox, Xbox has been working harder than they've ever worked to correct their issues in Japan. And I am more confident than I've ever been that in the future, we will have a world where we're not, a lot of these games are not skipping Xbox because Xbox has clawed and fought to prove that Xbox is an important force, especially in Japan. And you need to bring your games to Xbox. It's not an option of like, you're gonna skip it. Like you, the value of our platform is undeniable and you have to have an Xbox version. So I'm confident we'll get there. There's some work being done, but some there's done. still a lot of work that needs to be done. But I commend Phil. I commend the Xbox team because they're they're putting in the work. They're putting in the mm -hmm. steps and it might take some time or I should say it will take some time, but we're, we're getting there. We're, we're bridging that gap. We're building that best place to play. There you go. I'm going to get to a couple super chats real quick here. Harji Chani says, if Xbox continues the journey they're on, should be able to reach more gamers that can't afford expensive TVs and consoles with a low price for Series S and Game Pass. Hope the other two try as well. I, I absolutely agree. Game Pass, we'll talk about this more, a lot more in, a, in an upcoming segment, but Game Pass, it's the future. So either okay. jump on board or stay stuck in the past like a dinosaur. Are. There you go. Uh, RG Johnny says somehow a banger is anything PlayStation puts out. <gasps> Meta doesn't seem to matter. Nintendo should be the clear winner with their incredible games. I always joke about how I wish there was a hardcore, obnoxious group of Nintendo fans because we have the the vocal Xbox fans and we have the vocal PlayStation fans. But if anyone can flex sales numbers and if anyone can flex Metacritic bangers, it's Nintendo. Because they slap it down on sales. Last of Us 2, pathetic sales compared to Mario Kart. Pathetic sales compared to Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. But there's no obnoxious people online shouting that from the rooftop. So I, I wish there were. Just, just, just for the lulls. Uh, Super chat from Baron. J67. Uh, Baron. <laughs> they need to just make a third-person, over-the-shoulder, story-driven AAA game to compete for Game of the Year. Oh, that's Baron's running running joke that hey, it's this third person over the shoulder triple A game, it'll be game of the year. That PlayStation template. Shout out to Baron, loves this guy. Uh, yes, that and some <laughs> people want some people do want that, so I don't want to, you know, downplay. There is value to to that. Um for me, I like that Xbox has a good variety and Xbox has an emphasis on multiplayer because for me, one of my favorite things about gaming and why I play it every day is jumping online and playing with friends, keeping connected mm -hmm. with people that I love and sharing the experience of games together. I, I don't want to downplay the value of single player games because people want that. People appreciate that. Um, for my preferences and my taste, that is why I've gravitated towards Xbox because they've done a better job consistently giving me those multiplayer games. All right. We need to transition into Xbox's number one competitor and the, you know, the catalyst of the current console wars that we find ourselves in. And we're going to be, we're going to be doing the exact same thing for PlayStation. So David, what, what do you love about PlayStation's platform right now? That they are relentless. They don't care um, that you want, you know, this game on certain platforms, they will go and nab uh, something and make it exclusive in a heartbeat. Whereas Microsoft, it's all about, hey, we want to put this on as many platforms as possible, and it's fine. Let's put Ori, 
you know, on the Switch. And if PlayStation wants it, if they're cool with it, they can have it too. Um, PlayStation is relentless, where they'll go and swoop up the next Final Fantasy game. Uh, they'll go and swoop up the next, the, the uh, another game, and no one's gonna blink an eye, and no one's gonna question or make a fifty articles of whether or not this game is also gonna be on Xbox. It's gonna be exclusive to the PlayStation, and they could care less how you feel about it because they want games to be exclusive. Um, they do have those big stories that you will remember forever. You're going to remember every minute of uh, The Last God of War. You're going to remember the Uncharted games. You're going to remember Horizon Zero Dawn. They make movies. They make video games for people who love great, big, cinematic films. You know, the, you love a Michael Bay film, you're going to love something from Sony, right? And and that's hard. I mean, and, and I'm, I'm a... I love single-player games as well. I love multiplayer. Single, I, I'm more of a single-player gamer now than I was before. And I love that big story. I can sit down. It's me. I'm Kratos. And I'm going on this adventure. And every step of the way, I'm just like, holy crap. You got these big scenes. Visually impressive. You got games that was on PS4 that you would think was on the ne- ready for the next generation. Uh, big, beautiful games. Big, beautiful titles. And I love, I, I love how, don't get me wrong, I love how friendly Microsoft is. But sometimes the cutthroat that happens from Sony, I'm just like, yo, I wish Microsoft would just shoot back and not worry about what the community feels or, because if you remember when they did the Tomb Raider thing, everyone was so upset. Oh my God, how could Microsoft make Tomb Raider exclusive for the holidays? And like, the community was just on a rampage. Sony does that and no one cares. It's a cutthroat. Sometimes I want that for Microsoft. I want Microsoft to say, hey, the next iteration of such and such title that you probably played on your console before yeah that's only on xbox now deal with it and we move forward that's one thing i absolutely love about the playstation uh playstation as of right now playstation does an amazing job getting you excited about their games Mm -hmm. about their platforms and there's this undeniable undeniable kind of hollywood energy surrounding everything they do they they have a long history of making films. Sony Pictures has a long legacy of making films. They know how to hype something up. They do an amazing job. Their production team, when it comes to their presentations, top tier, absolutely incredible. And they, they get you excited about these projects. They also do a really good job marketing their, you know, their cutting edge features and Things like I didn't even know existed when I booted up my PS5 for the first time. Screen share in a party is one of the coolest features I've seen on any new console. And you can be in a party with your friends. You can be playing a game together and your friend can say, hey, I'm stuck. I'm stuck here. And you can be like, all right, share your screen with me. Let me see. They can pull it up in real time and you can watch them play the game in real time, minimize in the corner of your screen. You're like, all right, cool. Take this corner here. Take this corner here. And it's stuff like that that really shows that you know, as much as people like to criticize PlayStation about being stuck in the past with their pricing model, that they are forward mm-hmm. thinking when it comes to their games and when it comes to their platform. So PlayStation is pushing the boundaries with games frequently. And that is why their games are so highly regarded. Not all of them are for me. Like I've historically said that I don't really love The Last of Us. Like I, and that just comes from me not liking stealth games as much. Wow. But listen. Oh, nice. The, the, la- the intro to The Last of Us is one of the greatest moments in video game history. One of the most powerful opening s- sequences I've ever experienced in a video game. I understand why people love The Last of Us. I really do. It's, I'm not saying it's a bad game. It is a phenomenal game. It's just not something that necessarily pulled me in. That being said, I'm not going online saying that Last of Us is bad or la- I like mm-hmm. this better than The Last of Us because The Last of Us has value. It's an incredible game. Um, so for me... That's kind of areas that PlayStation really shines is when it comes to pushing cutting edge games and pushing cutting edge technology in their platform. Okay. Now, now we got to talk about areas that we want to see PlayStation improve on or there's some, some gaps for you right now. What, what does PlayStation need to do to make itself the best platform for you? Uh, the fact they're doing the complete opposite of what I loved about them is they're not doing anything multiplayer wise. Like it's it's almost as if everything is single player. You think about what their studios are doing, or what they've come out with. It's it's all single player content. Very few multiplayer experiences. It's like they they hedge their bets on okay, we got the marketing deal for Call of Duty, so we'll talk about a lot of Call of Duty about playing it early and playing it best and first on PlayStation. But where are those? staple multiplayer PlayStation games. 
I have a PlayStation and I do not subscribe to PlayStation Plus because I don't feel the need to it because if I'm going to play multiplayer, I'm going to play it on Xbox because I feel like that's the place to play for multiplayer titles um, from third party and first party. You only get those experiences on PlayStation from third party. Um, also, I think PS Now is a joke. Um, I don't think it'll ever be viable to me as an option for me to jump on until they start adding more of their first party titles. I know they recently added The Last of Us 2, mm-hmm. but it's only playable for like 30 days. There's too many games out right now for me to focus solely on. I mean, I had the game physically and I beat it, but if I didn't, there's too many games right now that are out that are coming out for me to focus on just The Last of Us 2 for 30 straight days to get it done. Um, I, I think that's silly. I think they get people excited for certain features that and they don't really explain to you um, the downfalls of it. For example, we're hearing that they're going to do the demos, the, the five, six hour demos. Mm-hmm. But they're not telling you that, hey, those that, that clock starts the moment you download it. And whether you're playing it or not, the clock continues. I think there's a lot of, you know, a lot of veil pretty veils over the stuff Sony says uh, as of late. Um, and they're not really truly telling you what's behind it. Um, still love the platform. The platform is amazing. I just really, where those multiplayer titles improve PS now because it's it's not worth it for me. Opinion. Reserve the right to be wrong. And give us real details on, on stuff like what you're going to do with these game demos because I, a lot of people are excited for this and I realize you're not getting five hours to play their next game. You're probably going to get like 30 minutes when you really look at how much you're playing it, how long it took you to download it because not everyone has fast internet, right? How long it took you to download it um, and really getting into the game. It's not really a five-hour demo. You're looking at maybe an hour tops, if that. Yeah, it's it's interesting to have these conversations. I see some people in the chat kind of, you know, declaring, you know, their love for PlayStation, their love for Xbox, and that's totally cool. I'm always of the camp that I will not fault anyone for preferring PlayStation. PlayStation does an amazing job. Nintendo does an amazing job. If you have a preference, that's totally cool. Um, regardless of what you prefer, it, it is really important that we have these conversations about the value of one platform and how these platforms, while competing, can can improve and at the end of the day if you prefer playstation um if they start you know understanding it where xbox is succeeding and incorporating some of that that they that will be a better platform and so for you that should be exciting that should be really exciting Mm -hmm. for me right now playstation i don't really like their their pricing model i think that is a huge flaw of their ecosystem their push for the 70 dollar game we're, we're going to see that more and more. Um, it's to be determined whether or not Xbox is going to kind of adopt that model with their first party. Uh, there, there's Game Pass will will kind of offset that for the people who buy into that service. But the fact that they are essentially charging this this new console tax as a way to you know get more money out of each of these releases to me is a lazier method than trying to shift the business model in a way that can offset some of those costs because i don't really believe that that ten dollars necessarily is going to the developers for these games and it's i don't necessarily believe that it is required for these games to be successful as we've seen with nintendo they're not charging 70 dollars, and they are wildly successful they are making a ton of money i understand that these games are incredibly expensive um playstation now as you mentioned you know if Xbox Game Pass didn't exist in the way that it currently exists, I don't think PlayStation Now would be considered a bad service. Um, I think it would just be, you know, a a service that existed as an option for PlayStation customers where you can play play games for for less. And I think it would be fine and people would just kind of subscribe or not. But now that we've seen Xbox Game Pass and now that we've seen these big games come day and date and every single first-party Xbox title is coming day and date, You can't tell me people aren't going to be excited about the Elder Scrolls. You can't tell me people aren't going to be excited about Starfield. You can't tell me people aren't going to be excited about Hellblade 2. And again, there are fair criticisms to be levied against Xbox's first-party output in recent years. But when all of those start hitting day one in Xbox Game Pass, that is going to put a ton of pressure on PlayStation. And it's going to really highlight the flaws of PlayStation now as a value proposition. Why sign up for this service when I could sign up for Game Pass where I get their biggest games 
every single one of their biggest games day one. I'm not waiting six months. I'm not waiting a year to get their biggest games. I'm getting them day one and I'm not paying $70 every time I want to play a big Xbox game. So for me, I really like a lot of what PlayStation is doing, but their pricing structure to me is, is a huge area of, of criticism. I agree. 100%. 100%. I mean, you know, like I talked about earlier, like 60 bucks is a lot of money. 70 bucks is. is a lot of money. And, you know, in the US, it's easier for us to be like, oh, whatever, 60 bucks, 70 bucks. But when you go outside of that, people are paying over $100 for a PlayStation mm -hmm. game. Like, again, like if you have a ton of spare income and that's, and you just can ball out of control, drop $70 a week and like it's no big deal, cool. Good on you. Awesome. Good on you. But please don't downplay or call people poor when they when they complain about those price points because it is a fair criticism. PlayStation needs to offset that cost to its customers to make its platform more appealing. They can't say, you know what, you want to play Demon Souls like me, who's a, who's an idiot who has that disposable income. I paid essentially six hundred dollars to play Demon Souls. That was the cost of entry for me to play Demon. Actually, no, I had to buy a year of PlayStation Plus to play online. So it cost me, after tax, probably close to $700 to play Demon Souls. Oh, now, bucko. Couldn't like, have been me. I can't ask anyone <laughs> else to do that. That's stupid. I'm stupid. But, you know, <laughs> I, I had that money to blow, and so I did. So, But not everyone does, and I don't think it's fair that we, you know say gaming is an expensive hobby and downplay when people criticize the pricing model because it is important. And when more people play games, um, that's only going to make the industry grow and that's only going to give more opportunities for these games to make money. So that's my biggest criticism. Now, what about Nintendo? Nintendo has always been the weird offshoot just out on its own island doing its own thing. It doesn't get roped into the console war nonsense. It's just... Nintendo is Nintendo, so it's kind of, it's hard to directly compare Nintendo to Xbox and PlayStation, but I definitely want to have some conversations about why Nintendo is great and why Nintendo is not great. So first off, David, where do you stand with Nintendo right now in terms of what they're doing well? Well, well, what they're doing well, I think them being different is a plus, right? Um, you, you said that we, we don't necessarily need PlayStation to, to be Xbox, Xbox to be Nintendo. Uh, they're they're off their own island doing their own thing, and they understand what works for them now. Uh, they had some issues last generation from the Wii to the Wii U, but when it comes to the Switch, they figured out what what works, and they realized, hey, people last gen just hated the hardware, so let's go ahead and reintroduce some of these games now. We're going to talk about the negatives in a little bit because that's also a negative point <laughs> because of the pricing. But they do understand, hey, people love these franchises. People um, may have hated the Wii, but they love the Mario game that was over. So let's go ahead and bring it over. And now people all of a sudden, oh, this is such a good game. This Donkey Kong game is actually pretty good. So they, they learn, they're learning from their mistakes with their hardware and say, okay, now we're going to do something a little bit different and we're going to capitalize on it. Uh, that's the thing I love about Nintendo. I do still love that they have that family family friendly vibe. Um, as a parent of two children, I love the fact that they have a Switch and I can use my mobile device uh, at, a, at any drop of a hat to adjust how they play, what they play, how long they play. I'll, as a parent, I do love that family friendly vibe. I don't necessarily have to worry about if my is my seven year old trying to play Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> you know on her on her switch you know i can see you know exactly what's been played on the switch at all times i know what's installed i love those features about the switch um and i i, I just love that nintendo they have a road that they want to go down and they're not going to pivot because of what playstation or what xbox is doing we have a brand, we know what we're doing, and we're going to stick to it. Love that about Nintendo. Stay the course. Nintendo doesn't yeah. give a damn what Xbox and PlayStation is doing, and I, I commend them to that. While we're talking about yeah. Nintendo, got to give a shout out to the, the one of the Nintendogs himself, Jeff Grubb. He's a big Jeff Nintendo Grubb. stan, um, and for good reason. I know, uh, for whatever reason, there's this weird group of hardcore Xbox fans who hate Nintendo. I don't, I don't know where that comes from, like what the, what the catalyst of loving Xbox and hating Nintendo, where that comes from, 
because Nintendo does an amazing job of innovating hardware and creating things that I didn't even know I wanted. When I saw mm-hmm. the Switch, I was like, what is this? I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bring my Switch to a rooftop with all these sexy <laughs> teens and play Mario Kart. This is this is stupid. And then no no, no <laughs> shit. Like Several months later, when the Switch launched, I brought that to a bar and I was playing Super Smash Bros. with friends at a bar. Like, I didn't even know I wanted that until I had it in my hands. And that is a huge reason I love Nintendo. Nintendo does a great job innovating not only their hardware, but their games as well. A lot of people say that Nintendo relies too heavily on nostalgia. And in some ways they do. With some franchises, they do. But you look at games like Super Mario Odyssey. In my opinion, that is the greatest 3D platformer that has ever been made. Super Mario Odyssey is an absolute masterpiece. And for that game to come out basically 30 years into a franchise's life cycle and come out and completely reinvent a genre, PlayStation's not doing that. Xbox isn't doing that. Breath of the Wild. Again, it's not my favorite Zelda. I'll say that outright. Like I know a lot of people love Breath of the Wild, consider it to be the best Zelda. I don't think it's the best Zelda, but... When you come out with a, again, a franchise that's existed for a long time and you reinvent the open world formula to a point where Xbox developers, PlayStation developers are citing Breath of the Wild as inspirations for their own games. Look at the new Horizon. That glider is ripped straight out of Breath of the Wild. Ripped straight out of the bow system. Like, like they understand, like everyone understands the importance of these games and Nintendo puts out amazing games and Nintendo doesn't have a lot of filler when it comes to the ecosystem or a lot of complex features. Like you buy the console and you buy the games and you play those games. And it's, it's kind of, kind of that simple. And I love that simplicity and I love what Nintendo is doing. But now we got to talk about while, while we're on this conversation, how can Nintendo improve? What does Nintendo need to do to improve? Uh-oh. We've we've said it multiple times here about people and their finances. I made a tweet about a year ago, and I said, with what's considered game of the generation, God of War, if it was released on the, if, if it wasn't a Nintendo first party game, how much would it be right now? It would still be 60. The Breath of the Wild is still $60, Miles. That is an issue. Why is it not 10 bucks used somewhere? I get it. Oh, Nintendo games hold the value. Nintendo needs to lower the price of these games. The the Switch, that was the first game I bought was Breath of the Wild. And I got rid of it. And I got almost all my money back for it when I got rid of it. I can't go back and and buy it for 20 bucks, 30 bucks. I have to pay at minimum 54 bucks. And that's for a used copy of the game. That is an issue for me. We can't get on Sony about the seventy dollar games and not get on Nintendo about the sixty dollar ten year old games. Like it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous, Miles. You know it to it's, be true. It's what, terrible. What's funnier to me is the fact that like there's been used Nintendo games that I've had to pay more money than the launch price was, <laughs> like on the Wii era and any of like the cartridge era, like. I've I've done that plenty of times. I've literally spent more money than it cost at launch to buy this this used copy of a, a Nintendo game. Um, we talked about this with Skyrim. I think a lot of that comes down to people are buying it. Mario Kart mm-hmm. 8 is a re-release that's still $60 and people still, it still mm-hmm. charts. It has sold so many copies. So if you're Nintendo and you're, char- you're selling this game at 60 bucks, you're selling more copies than anyone else. Why on earth would you drop it from 60 bucks? There's no incentive. And so that's why they do it. It's because people are going to buy it. And Nintendo they, takes full advantage of that. Full advantage. And then they go and make the Switch OLED with the same Joy-Cons. No one cares. Like, that's bad, people. We know these Joy-Cons have issues. And they release an, another, they release the OLED, which is, I'm sorry, it's not that big of a jump as, 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 as people are making it out to be. It's not the rumored 4K switch. And you have the exact same Joy-Con. It means you're going to have the exact same Joy-Con drift. You're going to have the exact same issues. And you're going to still be paying $60 for Breath of the Wild. As much as I love Nintendo, and much as we give them praise for, quote-unquote, saving gaming, 
they have some practices that I believe you're on an island and you're on the off the beaten path, but you have to pivot because that is an issue. If I wanted to go out and buy uh, my cousin a switch, uh, a, a switch light for that his purpose, and and he wants to play Breath of the Wild, hey, I got to pay sixty bucks for a game that's, that I bought day one with my three hundred dollar switch. That is wrong, man. It's absolutely wrong. I love Nintendo, but they need to fix it. Or Jesus is going to have to fix it. It needs to be fixed. Uh, yeah, Nintendo, their pricing model is is fascinating. It's an anomaly. Like, third-party publishers look at Nintendo and say, God damn, I wish we could do that. I wish we could... I wish Far Cry 6 could keep its value for more than three months. Like, I wish we could charge $60 for Far Cry 6 for two years. Like, people want that. And it's so weird that Nintendo can do it and get away with it time and time again. Like... One of my biggest issues recently with Nintendo is the that the limited releases and that Super Mario collection. Oh, yeah, that, that was wrong. Th so not only was that like the laziest port trilogy possible, not even 60 FPS on a Nintendo 64 game. Like, come on. Like, my God, those were just emulators bundled together. But they had the audacity mm. to charge $60 for it for a limited time. Limited time release of three old games running as they did on your switch and while it's cool that super mario sunshine can be played on the switch like I, the underrated gem i love super mario sunshine i don't care what anyone says it's an absolute banger um i don't like how nintendo has handled releases like that low effort high cost releases and people buy it it was the number one selling game on amazon for so long yep. Like, again, like, I want to be mad at Nintendo. I, I do. And in some ways, I am. But I also can't fault Nintendo who's running a business when people are buying it. People bought that. People were excited about the limited, like, time window for that. So it's frustrating because, again, we're, we're invested in all three. We see what Xbox is doing. We see what PlayStation is doing. But, again, Nintendo doesn't really care because they are successful as hell doing what they're doing. So, yes, pricing is an issue with Nintendo, and um, will it be addressed? Will it be changed? Um, nope. No. <laughs> no, not, unle again, unless there's some weird change where their game stops selling for some reason. But, yeah. <sighs> is that going to happen? Can Nintendo no. put out a game that people won't buy? No. They have a dedicated fan base. People love them. I mean, think about, I mean, my mother, may, may she rest in heaven. Um, my entire life, no matter what I'm playing, hey, uh, you going to play that Nintendo all day? This <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. This is a this is a say. Are you going to play that? I mean, Nintendo is ingrained in people's minds. It's and... an Xbox, mom. <laughs> <laughs> Put down that Nintendo. I'm like, oh, my God. But, yeah, it's it, it, it won't change because people love Nintendo, and they're going to... You know, look at everything Nintendo with rose colored glasses on. Yes. And so that that's another interesting conversation to have is the is is Nintendo reliant entirely on nostalgia, which you have people who say, yes, uh, I don't think they're entirely reliant on nostalgia. Nostalgia, as we've seen in all media, film, television, gaming, people are cashing in on nostalgia in huge ways. The 20th anniversary of Xbox. I just talked about all the dumb stuff I bought for that. That's nostalgia. The only reason I bought an OG Xbox hoodie was because of nostalgia. So people are cashing in on that regardless. It's not just a Nintendo thing. There is value to that. I don't think Nintendo is entirely reliant on nostalgia. But boy, oh boy, do they know how to market that like no one else. Jeff, don't, don't do that. Breath of the Wild 2 might be 70. I don't doubt it. Yeah, and when it releases, the original game will still be sixty. <laughs> Dude, Nintendo when they saw PlayStation raising that price to seventy, they're like, "Oh, word, we can get away with that." And you, th if PlayStation can can get away with it, oh, you bet, oh, you yeah. can guarantee that people people would pay a hundred dollars for Breath of the Wild two. People would do it in a heartbeat, dude. There's Breath of the Wild two could be a hundred dollars and still would be a, a, a sell ten million copies. Like, that is the weight of Nintendo, and that is wild. Xbox would be lambasted and roasted into oblivion 
If oh, yeah. once it gets to a point where Xbox sees Nintendo and PlayStation raising these prices, they're going to try it. They're definitely going to try it. No need to for it. Woo! It's going to be a way different conversation than when Nintendo says Breath of the Wild 2 is $70. So, Jeff, I, yeah, it's, I, don't, I, don't, I don't disagree with Jeff. More and more people are going to try it. A $70 price increase is going to be experimented with, especially when it comes to third party. Mm -hmm. um, and Xbox, at a certain point, I can't imagine they're just going to ignore it and say, everyone else is doing it, but that's not our thing. We don't really care about money. Oh, yeah. We don't really care about an extra $10 on a few million copies. That's, that's, not, our, that's not our bag. Xbox is great. Xbox wants to be your buddy, but Xbox also wants to make just raise the price of Game Pass by a dollar. That that uh that Oh, I'm yeah, I'm sure that's coming. That's, <laughs> uh, yo, Donnie, with the super chest, is question for both of you. Saw news recently that X Cloud is a hundred percent Series X blades now. How do you think this will affect the shortage of Xboxes in the wild? Um, we're gonna talk about that in depth here shortly. So I appreciate that point. We are definitely going to touch on that. Um. Because, yes, at launch, Xbox allocated a lot of its hardware resources to upgrading the servers. Because xCloud and Xbox Game Pass Ultimate was a huge pillar of their business. So that was one of the factors that made it harder to get an Xbox console, was a lot of that hardware was being used elsewhere. So let's transition. Let's move straight into the, the future of gaming here. And, and the reason I want to talk about this kind of was sparked by the interview that Jim Ryan had with at Games Industry Live recently where he was talking about the, the, the big global vision for PlayStation and how he wants play, these great PlayStation games to be played and enjoyed by tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of players. He even essentially called the PlayStation hardware a gate in this interview. So to me, that was, that was fascinating. Jim Ryan has come out on interview time and time again and talked about this approach of expanding the PlayStation platform, getting these games to more players. And for him to call the PlayStation 5, essentially a gate keeping them from hitting these metrics, I found incredibly fascinating. So what I wanna do now is talk about where we are headed. Yo, Donnie talks about, you know, xCloud being upgraded to, the, to Series X server blades. Have you tried xCloud since it was upgraded to the Series X server blades? I have, and it is a better experience. I know they're, um, you gotta, you, Depending on your internet, depending on where you are, if you're on Wi-Fi or if you got a, a 5G device, you can get 1080, 60 easily. I know the 4K is supposed to be coming, but you're getting a rock solid 1080, 60. Uh, before we were getting 720, 30, mm -hmm. uh, if that. But now you're getting. A, I got. A, I was playing Avengers, like I said, I was getting a rock solid 1080, 60, and I, I was really, really enjoying it. Um, I do think the next step. Uh, and we know we, Microsoft's Xbox has the the partnership with Samsung. Don't be don't be shocked if you open up your Samsung TV and there's a, a Xbox controller in there. You open it up and it's all it already has three months of Game Pass Ultimate in it, right? And then you're able to do stream those games, you know, via XCloud on that TV because it is so much improved now with these new blades um, that it's it's a viable option if you have decent to good, you know, internet connection. And that's convenience is king. Convenience is what is, is and will be way more important than your, your hardware moving mm -hmm. forward. That is the reality. We look at how it's completely changed music with streaming. We look at how it's changed, how we watch TV, enjoy movies. Like I'm a big audiophile. I'm a cinephile. I used to do a lot of like editing audio wise for, for films or, you know, full length feature films. So I used to be upset when I would like stream something on Netflix and I would notice the artifacting because you you can't avoid it even with a wired connection even with me having, you know, a gigabit down like there is artifacting because they're compressing the image especially on you know, I watch a lot of horror movies. I see the artifacting on the edge of the screen. I don't care. At the end of the day, I I just it's Way more valuable for me to be able to open up my, my TV, go to this app, hit play and watch something than it is to mm -hmm. either buy the disc, download it, and then watch it to eliminate that artifacting. The convenience is so powerful for me that I am willing to overlook a lot. And that's where we're at with xCloud. xCloud with these Series X upgrades, it's not native. And you, if you're comparing it directly to native, it is, it's not as good. But exactly. it is good enough. And for a lot of games, 
Like there is hardly any latency to the point where it's like, unless you're playing a fast paced shooter or like a competitive fighting game, like if you just want to play an RPG, boot up an RPG and mess around, like it is good enough. And that is Mm -hmm. huge as that improves. And as that gets better and better, that good enough bar is going to keep getting elevated and it's going to get to a point where people don't care. Like you can tell someone, go on your browser. We can play this, grab your phone. We can play this. Like that is how we consume movies and that's how we consume music. So why wouldn't that be how we consume video games? And typically, I mean, as you know, what happens in video games normally is the standard for most other things. So it's it's not I know it wasn't always plausible because of the internet for you actually be to be able to stream games and then be, you know, playable. Uh, but now that the gaming industry has a hold of it now, they're going to set, it's going to set, continue to, they're going to meet the standard and then set the standard before. Because vid- what happens in video games controls a lot in the world, how you consume movies, how you consume music, video games set that sets that standard. And this is the one thing that will be behind in because it was the more difficult task because of latency. No one wants to press yes. A wait a half a second then their character jumps. You need that almost instantaneous, right? So now that they figured it out, and what what we're seeing with uh, with XCloud, it's going to get better and better. And like I said, you're going to open up a box, uh, your TV, and you're going to instantly be able to play your Xbox games uh, from Xbox Game Pass Ultimate via XCloud instantaneously, booting right into it. And it's 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 the future. We know it's it's great, but I it's almost I'm going to say the future is right now because I can do that with my phone, with my my laptop. With my OG Xbox, the future is today. It's happening now, and it's going to be amazing. The future is now. Yet yeah, we are, you know, seeing this huge evolution. We, earlier, we talked about how far gaming has come in twenty years since the launch of the original Xbox, and how many mm-hmm. things have innovated and evolved. And now we are at a point where Xbox is about to have a Game Pass app built into TVs. Like I remember Netflix exploding for that reason. I used yep. to work, uh, you know, as a clerk in a home electronics store. So I would talk to customers who were like, you know, what is, what is Netflix? They would see the logo on the box and they would say, what is Netflix? And I'd be like, oh, it's dope. You can just stream movies. And they'd be like, what? Really? Like, how much is it? Like, it's probably a lot, right? I'm like, no, it's like eight bucks a month. And they're like, wait, what? Like, I can just watch hundreds of movies for eight dollars a month. And it like blew their minds. Like, and eight so bucks? that's a long time ago. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was a long time ago. It's, it's jumped up a little bit, but a little bit. What happens when we start seeing Xbox Game Pass on TV boxes and people are like, oh, damn, I can pay 10 bucks a month or 15 bucks a month and I can just play the new Halo. I can play the new FIFA like, damn, that's cool. I'm going to do that. And there's going to be people who would never in a thousand years ever buy a Xbox console or a PlayStation console or a Nintendo console. who are going to see this and be like, oh, it's this easy. All right, I'm in. And that's the value of it is it's it's not for everyone. It's not going to completely replace native hardware. I don't think native hardware ever will ever completely go away. But catering exclusively to native hardware is not the future. PlayStation gets that as much as loud PlayStation fans online want to say that PlayStation will never have day and day PC releases. That is not the reality. That is not the reality, and that will not be their future. Jim Ryan is telling you this over and over and over again. Like, that is not the future of PlayStation. It's not. And I know, again, I'm a console heathen. I get it. I don't want to envision a world where console hardware doesn't exist anymore. But if you had told me, you know, when I was rocking my Walkman on the bus back in the day, back in elementary school, that I wouldn't be listening to CDs, I would have said, no, dog, you're crazy. There's no other way. So... Once there is a way that is widely available and easy to access, people are going to be like, I don't really care about a console. It's it, Streaming isn't the best experience, but you know what? It's good enough. If, if, it, if it works and it's convenient, like you said, it's good enough, I don't, I, I don't have to try to pack up my Xbox Series X or S with me. I can just use it on my phone. Why wouldn't you? It's convenient. It's there. It's ready, available, and it works. So let and me. He's, he's like Walkman is weird. I could have swore you're like 22 years old. <laughs> so he, and he thought about it, I'm like, man, he's right there with me. Okay, I see you, Miles. I'm I'm blessed with some good genes. I'm I'm older than people think I am. Um, that's for sure. But yeah, I was I was rocking a, a CD Walkman on the bus to let you know how old I was. Um, or how old I am. 
So one final question before we transition from this topic. What is David's dream future for video games? What does that look like? You know, if, if I could be completely honest, and, and I know you can see it as a, as a big contradiction on things I said earlier, um, but it's for you better play any game you want with anything you want to play it on. I, I know that's a, a future that'll never happen, um, but I don't, I don't feel the future of gaming should be restrictive. And I know that's what Microsoft is doing with that saying, hey, you know, we, we're willing, they'll put Game Pass on PlayStation 5 if PlayStation allows it. Mm -hmm. they, they they really will they, yeah. they'll, they'll put it on if they allow it they'll do it right and i think to me that is my future of gaming like i don't want to be restricted i want to i don't want to feel like i need to go and be miles and pay 500 dollars for a ps5 just to play demon souls like i don't feel like i i should have to do that you know my so my future of gaming is the, the these walls these invisible walls that we place up you know around each one of these consoles I, those should be gone you know, the future is I should be able to sit down and I should have this one thing and I should be able to play, you know, whatever I want to play on it. And I think that's a future that Microsoft wants. Um, it's a future that never happened because of companies with different philosophies. But that is my future of gaming is that I no longer I'm no longer restricted to how I can play, where I can play and when I can play it. I love that. I'm right there with you. Like my dream future is. I go into my living room. I have a controller on my coffee table. I turn on my TV. On my TV, I have a PlayStation app, I have a Nintendo app, and I have an Xbox app. And I can go in there and I can just play any of those games instantly. There's no latency whatsoever. Picture quality is top tier, and it's that easy. Like, mm -hmm. no matter what I want to play, I have it at my fingertips anytime. And it's as simple as opening up an app and selecting the game. And that's it, we're playing, we're live, we're online playing with friends. I plug in my headset to my one controller I have in my living room, and that's it. That is, that is my dream future. Again, as long as there are consoles, I will buy them. I will pay dumb money for them every single time because I'm, I'm a dumb, small-brained lizard man and I like the new shiny things. Um, <laughs> but if I'm being realistic and if I'm being honest with myself, that's the future I wanna live in. Mm -hmm. So thank you for having this conversation with me. It was it was a long one. Hey. I, I appreciate the chat staying civil. I know, uh, you know, it, it gets tough to talk about opposing views, you know, especially how on great of a community you have. This, this, I've been reading the, the comment section and I'm blown away. What a amazing community that you've built here. And they, everyone at, at, at Windows Central has built here. You, Jizz, everyone, because we've had opposing opposition, opposing things. And people have had different opinions and no one got uncivil. No one, there was no name calling. I mean, unless you got the greatest minds in the world and they took it all out, it was great to see this. And it just goes to show the work that you've put in, Miles, as a content creator to have such an amazing community that you've built. And I am, I'm blown away, honestly. Uh, I'm blown away that anyone tunes into the show at all, if I'm being completely honest. <laughs> like, And to see this amazing group of regulars tune in every week. And like you said, like, what I love about this show is that we, we have these conversations that have, you know, that could have negatively passionate responses from, from the audience, but everyone here gets it. Everyone here is for, here for the same reasons because we love video games. Obviously I prefer Xbox. I work for Windows Central. Like obviously my focus is going to be Xbox, but I talk about on every single show, you know, what I love about PlayStation, what I love about Nintendo, what I love about gaming as a whole. And so, I think that's kind of why we can have these conversations without it turning ugly. Because we're not, I'm never coming in here and saying, yo, PlayStation sucks as much as people would just up clap. Yeah, PlayStation does suck. You're right, dude. I, I like, there are people who just want that. And that's, I'm not interested at all in that. Respect. Respect. Because I, 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 it's easy, it's easy to be that way. It's easy for people to grow that way. Um, but like I said, the, what you guys are, you know, have built here and, and miles and man, I, I absolutely love you, man. Uh, I, I am, I am blown away by your community and shout out to everyone who's, who's, who's in the chat and you, you guys are awesome. And I, I, I definitely, definitely would love to rock out with you guys again. Cause you, you guys have a, an amazing community here, man. And, uh, it's awesome. 
Shout out to this audience because they they crush it. They kill it. Super positive. I said this a few episodes ago, and I, I say it without any sort of exaggeration. But when it comes to, you know, chats, this is one of the best groups online, like by a lot, because I lurk in a lot of podcasts. And, you know, like like we talked about, some people want to tune in for the wrong reasons. They want to mm-hmm. tune in for that confirmation bias. They want to tune in for the spicy takes, for the dunks, all, all that kind of stuff, which it's fun. I get it. I, I, from a competitive standpoint, from a like football team sports analogy standpoint, yeah. I get it. You want your you wave your green flag high and say our team is the best, and that's cool. That's fun. You you can do that, but you you don't have to be mean to the other team. You know, hundred percent. So we're let's final quick little topic here because we're running a little late we're just going to do some quick impressions on a a handful of games that have come out recently um i'm going to start with nickelodeon all-star brawl have you played this at all david i haven't but i i enjoy uh seeing clips from you uh i'm not gonna be i'm not gonna lie i forgot that it was coming out so soon um i was just saying that yesterday i was like i gotta go pick it up so i'm probably gonna pick it up after this show today uh because me and cora have some damage to do um, but I have been enjoying the clips that you posted and you've been playing. So but I haven't yet, but I am enjoying what I'm seeing from you. Yeah, I've anyone who knows me knows I've been excited about this game. I love Super Smash Bros. Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, in my opinion, is the greatest fighting game that's ever been made. Absolutely magical once in a lifetime experience. Um, so I wanted, you know, some kind of answer to that on Xbox as someone who prefers to play on Xbox. And these devs seem to get why people love Smash Bros. They, they catered to the, the competitive scene. They, they catered to what makes Smash Bros. great. And then they were able to get a bunch of amazing licensed Nickelodeon characters. SpongeBob versus Nigel Thornberry. The second I saw Powdered Toast Man, I was like, these guys oh. get it. <laughs> these guys get it. I'm here for it. So I did the review for Windows Central. Um, I gave it a 7 or a 3.5 out of 5 um, because the core gameplay itself is really fun. Um, it's fast paced. It's fluid. Um, the characters have really interesting kind of dynamics and move sets. But my God, did it come in hot? It is the screen tear. I played it on PC and I played it on Series X. Screen tearing on Series X at launch was unbelievably bad. I have oh, a wow. variable refresh rate display too. So this was like best case scenario. And wow, they have put a patch out since that have, has made it better on some stages. But some stages run like garbage. On P- I, there was a stage on PC. Like most stages for me ran 4K 60, occasional drops here and there. I had one that ran it, was down to like 26 FPS. Like huge tanks in performance on this. So needs some optimization. It needs some work. I want it to explode because there's been this kind of leaked list of DLC characters, including Shredder, Garfield. <laughs> Garfield is... Uh, an odd oh, choice, but I'm excited. Down with Garfield. <laughs> Mr. Crab, Squidward, Lasagna. Plankton. Like, they have a huge slate of upcoming fighters scheduled for this game. So I don't want the game to, like, the community to fall off and die right away. But the launch came in way hotter than I was expecting, which was kind of a bummer. So game is solid, but in its current state is filled with bugs. You can't use directional inputs on the D-pad. Controllers Ooh. desync constantly. Um, Maybe I won't be buying it today. I would say thanks for, thanks for, I'll keep thanks you for, up to date. I'll keep you. Yeah. I'll let you know when it's safe because if you want a Smash Bros. like on Xbox, this is a solid option. I am just hoping that it irons out the, the kinks because the launch is it's, it's not rough. ready yet. It's rough. Yeah. Thank you for saving me 40 bucks. I'll uh, I'll yeah. wait until you, you DM me and say, all right, it's safe now, fame. <laughs> Go and spend your I'm still playing bucks. with people online, so I'll, I'll let you know. I'll let you okay. know. It's not, it's not bad. Like, it's not unplayable. There are just some issues that I feel really hurt the overall experience. The frame rate drops uh-huh. and the screen tearing especially. Like, when I'm playing a fighting game, I can't have screen drops like or frame rate drops. Like, it needs to be smooth has to be now let's talk about battlefield 2042 battlefield 2042 uh the beta is live and it took me a couple days to play it but when i first went online people were not stoked i saw a lot of hyper negative 
responses to the Battlefield 2042 beta. So you've played a few rounds. I've played a few rounds. Where are you at right now with, with Battlefield? Delay it some more. Delay it some more. And I'm not the biggest, you know, Battlefield player. I, I, I've i transitioned. I used to be, like, really heavy into COD, you know, and I've tried to give Battlefield a chance, really, really since Battlefield 4. Um, it's It needs to cook a little longer, especially for this being a $70 multiplayer-only game. I shouldn't be running into bugs and glitches and, and all these issues. Granted, we get the excuse that this was an old build. I'm sorry. I've never been one to buy that. This is an old build. Because as a developer... Oh, as an artist, if I'm drawing a picture and I'm ready to release the picture to the world, I'm not going to give you a picture of a face missing both eyes and 17 teeth. I'm not going to do that, right? I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I'm not going to show you that, right? So I don't believe this is an old build. And the the frustrating thing is, a lot of the complaints that we're having with the game are the same complaints that people had during the original NDA uh, alpha test. Uh, so some of the same glitches, same bugs. Just delay it. It's okay. Um, it's 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 just a, it's a multiplayer game. It's okay. I know I know it's been pushed a little bit. Push it back even further. Do it and, and do another beta. Um, don't drop a seventy dollar game that has to be patched again within a week. Not when I have to spend again seventy bucks for this title. I'm actually going to cancel my pre order. I, it's just not ready not ready we're, we're really seeing we're really and truly seeing the impact that that COVID has had on development with a lot of these releases this holiday a lot of these people you know have been working hard doing everything they can to make sure that these launches are as smooth as possible um but we're seeing time and time again like the the, the polish that we're accustomed to in a lot of cases just isn't there and probably won't be there because battlefield did get delayed by three weeks and that mm -hmm. That the idea of Battlefield getting delayed at all into 2022 tanked EA stock prices massively, tangibly. The idea that their biggest game was not coming out for the holiday tanked it. As soon as it was confirmed to come out before Black Friday, the stock shot right back up. Right back up. So the impact yep. of getting this out for that window is unfortunately probably not something they're going to consider skipping. Um, so Battlefield 2042, yes, buggy, quite buggy. A lot of weird texture bugs for me. A lot of like mm -hmm. big elongated stretches of light and texture just flashing and rippling for me on Series X when I spawn in. And that's like consistent. Almost every time I spawn in, there is that issue. Um, that being said, I got to say that the game looks pretty damn good. Like on Series X, like watching a helicopter fly over trees and grass and seeing the the grass shake the brush move that's cool that feels really epic it really kind of ties into the scale of this game and it really gives me that feeling of battlefields all-out warfare 128 mm -hmm. players as well like considering the scale of that the game looks pretty impressive visually looks good it looks having the, the particle effects coming down mm -hmm. from the, the grass and the fire and the explosions and a lot of that stuff looks amazing. The smoke clouds from missiles coming out of jets, phenomenal. Like the game is gorgeous, but it's not in terms of gameplay that big of an evolution for me. I felt like I didn't really enjoy the way it controlled. And I don't know if that's just me or if you feel the same way, but after playing stuff like Halo and after playing a lot of modern first person shooters, I thought it controlled okay. Which if the main point of this game is first person multiplayer, competitive mm -hmm. multiplayer, I wanted it to feel a little bit better and feel a little tighter than it does. So I left I agree with that. underwhelmed, honestly, by my experience with the beta. I, I definitely could, I can agree with it, and, and again, it's. I I, I don't think it'll necessarily be bad. Um, I I do think a lot of people are going to have a lot of fun with it. I know some people who have said they've had you know almost flawless runs in their games, and I don't know what type of super console you were playing on. Um, but I think visually, yes, it it does look good. But man, some of the issues with with with, with different pop ins and I, that grappling hook I've had weird time for it just like shot it, it wasn't like there 
I, I just had some weird issues. I'm just not like, yeah, these, like when, when you're a $70 multiplayer only title, those little, those details have to be there. Th those, those stutters can't be there. It needs to be on point. And I just think if it needs to cook a little longer, let it cook. Uh, it, it might be one thing to where I might just wait until it's patched, you know, two or three times in the first two or three weeks, and then I'll go out and pick the title up again. I see the potential of it. This yes. has a legitimate opportunity to reinvigorate Battlefield in a huge way. Despite me being kind of underwhelmed with the gameplay and, you know, some of these weird texture issues, it was still ridiculously fun to get the squad in a truck and just bomb over hills, run into people, jump out, get bombed by airstrikes. There's so much beautiful chaos to, to battlefield 2042 and that's without a lot of the cool weather stuff that we've seen so far so oh, exactly did you get the tornado i didn't get the tornado i didn't even get it i didn't get a wingsuit in the tornado which is probably why i'm i'm lukewarm i feel like that would have been the game changing moment for me like all right it's i get it i get it now but did you get the tornado did you get to experience I not. that I, I have a friend of mine who he played his first five matches he got it three times what I, I so played if, six if, matches and didn't get it once. Not not one time. So I I don't know what the disparity here is. I'm almost like trying to get that shiny Pokemon. <laughs> like has this person has seventeen thousand shinies and I have three. It's not fair. Um, but yeah, he got it out of his first five matches. Got it three times. I'm like, yeah, I wish I can experience at least once. But no, I haven't got no. to experience it yet. Maybe one day. So. <sighs> Battlefield's in a weird position for me right now because it went from a title that I was going to pick up at launch. Like, I was originally not expecting to care about Battlefield 2042 before the reveal, but they sold me. Like, they sold me on the reveal. They sold me on the trailer. They sold me on the gameplay we saw after that, and I was ready to pick that up day one. Then the delay comes out, and now it's a couple weeks away from Halo, and now that I've played the beta, I don't think I'm getting it on day one. I fell with you. I'm, wait. I'm no longer day one. I'll wait for a few patches. And, um, we'll, we'll see what happens. Get, maybe a month or so after release, I'll be there. Because, I mean, let's be honest, I'm be playing Halo. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be so tied up in Halo. And it's kind of weird going back and forth in between FPSs because they, they these two games feel completely different. So, I mean, Halo is going to hold it down for me. So, I, I think I'll be okay not paying that 70 bucks right now. It's in the interest of my wallet that I don't, because I know I would buy Battlefield, I would play it for a couple weeks, and the second Battlefield came, or Halo dropped, I would be Wait. dropping Battlefield hot, and it yep. would never get touched again. You, you're probably, you're probably uh, for a lot of people, you're best uh, suited to wait for it to get inside of the EA vault, which you have access to because of Xbox Game Pass, because it's the best service in gaming. Yes, just saying. Xbox Game Pass is the best deal in gaming. That is not hyperbole. That is just the reality. That's the world that we live in. Um, you don't have to subscribe. You, you really don't. But to say it's not the best value is it's just untrue. Mm -hmm. It's untrue. And with that, we are going to end this episode of Xbox Chatter Days. David, thanks so much for hanging out with me, dude. One more time for all of the amazing folks listening in, joining us. Let them know where they can find you. Oh, yes, please. Uh, I am on Twitter at FameyNT2K, which you guys can see on screen. I also am one of the six people who run the at LV1 Gaming Twitter handle. Uh, please come by, check out the channel. Uh, search up LV1 Gaming on YouTube. Look at the big phoenix. If you see it, that is us. Uh, please give us a ch uh, chance to entertain you. Uh, Miles, it has been uh, an absolute pleasure. Like I said, this is a pillar podcast for me on Saturdays. And to be on here with you, uh, it's absolutely amazing. You are one of the good guys uh, in gaming. And I can't wait till we see you at the Video Game Awards <laughs> in the future because it needs to happen because you are such an amazing person. Uh, shout out to your community here. You guys have all been so welcoming and so cool. Uh, I saw lots of compliments in the chat. You guys have been absolutely amazing. Thank you guys so much. And yeah, man, just LV1 Gaming anywhere. You see the Phoenix, that is us. And uh, it's been a absolute pleasure. And I can't wait to have you back on Double XP. And uh, you come out over with the team and we, and we have some fun. You let me know when it's happening. I'll be there, dude. I got you. I got you. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. Have an excellent weekend. And we will see you next week. Take care, everybody.